the notice and summons of the meeting, please, Chief Executive. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members. To all members of Governance and Strategic Planning Committee, you hereby summon to attend the monthly meeting of the committee to be held remotely today, Tuesday, the 2nd of February at 4 o'clock. Starting with the roll call. Aslan. Here. Alderman Hussey. Members, just reminding you of your uh, mute buttons when you're speaking or colleagues who are joining from other organizations. Alderman McClintock. Alderman McClintock. Here. Alderman McCready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Shaw, and Shaw, John, can you hear me? Sorry, that's Michaela. Members, sorry, there's an off lot of background noise and telephones ringing there. Can you go with you? Hi, let me see. Can you not mute all? I'm not sure who that is, Chair, but. Um, Do you see? User two. It's the host. It's IT with callers. Okay. Are we now sorted? Yeah. Apologies for that, members. Um, Councillor John Boyle. Here. Um, Councillor Michaela Boyle, had you there? Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Cooper. Sure, Councillor Donnelly. See you there, Gary. Uh, Councillor Duffy. Sure. Councillor Fleming. Councillor Fleming. Councillor Gallagher. Oh. Councillor McKeever. Councillor McKeever. Councillor Mooney. Councillor Mooney. John. Thank you. And Councillor Riley. Here, John. Thank you. And Councillor Fleming is there. Thank you, Paul. Okay, Chair, it's back to you. Uh, Chief Executive, I'd like to remind everyone uh, in remote attendance that this meeting will be broadcast live by our Council's YouTube uh, channel, will be available for viewing by the public and media. The broadcast will also be available for repeated viewing at a later date. This broadcast may be ter terminated or suspended in accordance with members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to the use and storage of these images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. A copy of the Council's Privacy Notice may be found on the Council website www.derrystraban.com. Members, um, we're moving on. Our first item is item five. It's a presentation, and I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. McDade of NIPSA, uh, Stuart Smith from the University of Birmingham, and uh, Mr. Bailey from the Northern Ireland House Executive, and Professor T. Robert Chairperson. The presentations will be from uh, NIPSA and the University of Birmingham. Uh, there will be no other presentation, and we we have received copies of the relevant presentations. Uh, so I can I hand over, and I presume I'm passing firstly to uh, Ms. McDade of NIPSA. If you're ready, Sheena. Thank you, Sheena. Good afternoon, all. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. Can 
Uh, another problem for you just go, go on ahead. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation to come to the meeting today and to address you, um, albeit virtually. It's not ideal, but we'll run with it. Um, so I'll just go straight to it. Um, following the announcement of the DFC Minister in November 2020, setting out proposals to revitalise NIHE, NIPSA wishes to welcome the focus and attention on housing as it has been relegated for some time with many in politics prioritising health and education. Housing is a fundamental basic need that we all should have a right to. Much of the statement is given to the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and that also is welcomed. However, the overarching theme of the statement is that NIHE must change and become either a mutual or a cooperative, which of course then changes how it will be financed should either model be accepted. It will no longer be a people and public organisation. To put the statement in context, the Housing Executive has been underfunded for many years and its role within our community diminished. Tenants themselves have deemed this as a managed decline and feeling in the community is that this is purposeful in order to essentially privatise yet another valuable and historic public asset which was hard fought for. It is evident of how valued the NIHE is by tenants, customers, the community, indeed our elected public representatives in many areas. We only have to look to the Grange in Ballyclare and Billy in Ballymena who voted overwhelmingly in favour of staying with NIHE as their landlord and more, rejecting the failed smaller scale breakup of the NIHE via the now defunct small scale stock transfer programme. Our communities have clearly demonstrated that they have confidence in NIHE and that any move to a non-public service body is detrimental to the community, workers, those languishing on waiting lists, tenants and society as a whole. NIPSA, the community and history, has already shown the NIHE as being apolitical, fair, balanced and ultimately accountable to the community. The Housing Executive has a long history of tenant engagement, working side by side to encourage and facilitate a more cohesive society and have established many tenant led initiatives, empowering the community as a whole. With the current suggestion that NIHE changes, essentially what this means is that half of the NIHE as we know it would lose public accountability and identity in order to access the finance required through financial transactions capital. This finance cannot be accessed by a public organisation. This could have devastating consequences for us all, tenants, customers, those in waiting lists, employees and any and all stakeholders. To pursue the splitting and ultimately the breakup of NIHE removes the existing public ownership and accountability we already have in place. Pursuing a mutual or cooperative model undermines the entire history and only serves to dilute the foundation of the housing executive and why it was formed in the first place and further leaves it vulnerable to changes potentially in the future. NIPSA has conducted much research in the housing and recently focused this on the mutual and cooperatives as can be read in Dr Stuart Smith's 21st Century Housing for Northern Ireland. This report is timely and examines what happens in mutual and cooperatives and the effect on the community, services, customers, finances and employees. To conclude, we already have a bespoke housing model that is unique and that serves the community of Northern Ireland in the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sheena. And if members are content, I'll move on to the University of Birmingham report, uh, and then members may have queries that they can follow up on. Are members content to move to the second presentation? It has been referred to by Sheena in her presentation there. Uh, before I do that, Sheena, is there anything else you want to add? We have the uh, written version of your presentation, but is there anything you wish to add? Um, not at the moment, but we're very happy to engage and answer questions as we go along or at the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sheena. Members content to accept then the, the next presentation, or do you wish to raise questions now? If so, the chat box is open. I have nothing coming up on the chat box. So can I move to uh, Stephen Smith from the University of Birmingham? I can't see you there. I can see your presentation, Stephen. Uh, I can't see you. Sorry, Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Ah, very good. Are you ready to move on? Good. Yeah, yeah, happy to do that. That's great, Stephen. Um, are, are you happy? Obviously, the presentation's up. I'll just say when I want the next slide to move along, I think. Is, is that the protocol? Yeah, we, we can work on that. That's that's great. Stephen, if you can, go ahead. Okay. Yes, fine, thanks. Um, 
so thank you very much for the invitation to uh, to speak to uh, you today. Also, thank you to Nula Mian for the help in terms of liaising with me uh, and getting the presentation in place, etc. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. The um, I noted the motion at the time that it was it was passed, and also the wording. Uh, both in the motion and also uh, uh, in the invitation letter here. So I'm going to be quite tight and actually speak to the specific wording uh, um, from both of those. Uh, there, this is a huge uh, issue that has many different dimensions and aspects to it. Um, I want to try and keep the, my presentation short so as we have time for any questions um, and discussion afterwards, I'm perfectly happy to. Uh, partake in, in those as well. So the brief that I was given was to talk about the deleterious impacts moving to mutual cooperative model on the provision of social housing, on tenants' rights and on accountability. Um, and what I intend to do over the, the next few slides is just to start off by talking about what we understand or we mean by the term reclassification, because that's it. If you go back and look at the minister's statement, in November, that's at the heart of uh, this debate. And then we'll go through those three areas of social housing provision, tenants' rights uh, and accountability, and hopefully there'll be plenty of time for discussion afterwards. Uh, next slide, please. So the one I've just picked out, one of the occasions here where Minister Nikulon um, uh, mentioned about the intention to change the classification of the housing executive in her statement uh, last November, uh, to uh, change the classification to a mutual or cooperative designation so that it may borrow. Um, and of course, what's driving this is the rules that are set by uh, Westminster and Whitehall set in the Treasury uh, and kind of implemented in lots of ways by the Office for National Statistics about what is considered to be the public sector and the private sector. Um, and in lots of ways, the, and this is often, I think, diminishes the argument, it's said that, that this rotates around government accounting rules and what's classified as public or private for government accounting rules, but there is a lot more to what goes on, I think, in these processes. Um, this is a long-term uh, uh, policy that uh, emerged in the late 1980s and the early 1990s uh, across the water in Britain. Um, where it was to take uh, council housing from local authority control and give it over to housing associations. Usually uh, housing associations were formed specifically for that purpose rather than pre-existing ones, because housing associations are considered to be in the private sector, even if they're not for profit, even if they don't distribute their uh, uh, surpluses, they're in the private sector for government accounting rules uh, and for borrowing purposes, and um, uh, and so this would not then impact on government uh, debt rules. Of course, the other thing that's important to remember in all this is that we have lived through a period now of 20, 30 years or more where government policy has been in preference the whole time about the private sector and the markets delivering services um, uh, uh, across, the, uh, across the board. And so even though there is it's a technical government accounting rule. It's actually part of the bigger policy about trying to shift more and more uh, public services out to be delivered in private uh, in private ways through the markets, etc. And one of the ways I try to kind of explore this it, 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 uh, or explain this in in relation to the process of classification, because reclassifying doesn't sound like privatization. It doesn't sound like it's moving the housing executive to the private sector for uh, government uh, accounting rules uh, and indeed for borrowing uh, from private sector and capital finance capital markets. But the same logic applies uh, or is being applied here that applied uh, last May and June in relation to the, uh, the Housing Act, the Housing Amendment Act 2020. And because what had happened was back in 2016 the office for national statistics looked at the relationship between uh the stormont assembly the stormont government uh, and the housing associations and had decided that 
the government had too much control over housing associations. So what we had to do was introduce uh, and then decided that the housing associations were on the public books. And uh, this had gone on for, for, for a number of years. The same thing had happened to, across in Britain. And the Housing Amendment Act was brought in to dilute that control. So as you could then go back to the Office for National Statistics and say, these housing associations have been moved back into the private sector. Now it's a, the, and the terms that we're using there was about classification. We're reclassifying from the public sector to the private sector. The same process is being proposed for the housing executive. Uh, and one final point, uh, it's not on this particular, uh, this particular slide, but I think it's important and it flows from the uh, Chartered Institute of Housing uh, webinar that was uh, broadcast last week. And uh, John Perry in particular, long-term housing expert looking at this area uh, in Britain, was very clear about uh, what this means in terms of the decision to uh, reclassify the, uh, the housing executive. The people to convince are the Office for National Statistics. And there is no one clear way of saying the, the control uh, has been released or relinquished. They will look at control in a whole myriad of ways and they will decide then uh, on the basis of uh, uh, their assessments whether or not the government still has, the department still has control over the housing executive. So that's what's going to happen in terms of the decision in, in, in terms of reclassifying. Um, right, can I have the next slide, please? So with that as the, the context, and of course, I think there are issues here even with that as the basis that we can talk about uh, 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 maybe later. Do you want us to talk about the provision of, of social housing? Right. Um, and, I think it's a, these numbers are, are quite important. Are quite important, and they illustrate actually about the role of housing associations and whether housing associations are in a position when we don't have control over directing actually developments are in a position to uh, deliver new bills. So I'm not talking here specifically about the huge backlog that there already is uh, in the housing executive in relation to. Uh, maintenance and repairs, but in terms of building new houses. And the key column to look at here is the one in the middle, 1995-96, because it's at that time the decision is made to take the money away from the housing executive and give to the housing associations to build uh, new houses, the social housing grant. And you can see I've done, and these are, are no way have I chosen particularly adverse figures here on this. We know that we would expect that as has happened with the housing executive is no longer building any houses because it's not funded to do that. But the housing associations haven't stepped up. They haven't stepped up and filled in the gap that has been left by the housing executive not being allowed to build new, uh, uh, new homes. And part of this, this is despite hundreds of millions of public funding actually going into that sector over the last uh, uh, 20 years. In fact, over the last five years, it's uh, over 300 million has been given to the housing associations in terms of public funding, but we're not seeing that delivered through in terms of, uh, in terms of new build housing. So the worry then would be that we are repeating the same mistake here again. We move the housing executive over into the private sector. We relinquish control over directing um, uh, uh, the uh, strategic activities of the housing executive. And again, we're in a situation where we're not seeing the new bills uh, come through in the way that we would, uh, we would hope. Everybody is in agreement that the housing executive needs to be able to borrow and needs to, fu uh, to fund new build uh, housing. The question then is actually, how do we do this? The worry is that I would have based on this experience is that we move it over to the housing, uh, uh, over to the private sector, and we don't get the new bills. We, we may get, we'll may get some clearance of some of the backlog of maintenance, but we won't get, may not get the new bills. Next slide, please. And this is the other thing that also happens as well when we move over in terms of provision of social housing and move over to uh, the private sector and housing associations, whether they're uh, registered or registered social landlords, whether they're housing associations, whether they're mutuals or cooperatives, 
is that we have the exam examples and a growing number of examples now where we have regeneration processes that actually lead to a reduction in the number of social housing homes available. I'd, um, so, some of you may remember a few years back, there was a lot of talk about trying to apply the Glasgow model to the housing executive uh, transfer, because it's similar size in terms of the number of homes, 80,000. Um, you look at Glasgow, though, 80,000 homes were actually transferred over. And the first thing that happened was a, de a demolition pro uh, pro project that knocked down the housing staff uh, uh, stock uh, by half, and it's never recovered since. And even something much more recently, we're having the uh, the examples that are often being given now because of a mutual of Rochdale Borough Wide Housing. They're in the moment they're in the process of regenerating what's known as the Seven Sisters in the centre of Rochdale, the tower blocks uh, uh, there that were built in the 1960s to the highest possible specification at the time because they were trying to attract young professionals to commute from the centre, uh, uh, to, to come out of the centre of Manchester, to go and live in Rochdale and actually commute in from there. So these are, these are high quality uh, homes that were built at the time. They're knocking them down, plan to knock down 480 flats and replace them just with 120 uh, uh, houses. And this pattern of regeneration happens time and time again uh, 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 over uh, over in Britain. So the worry again would be if we relinquish control over the housing executive by moving it into the private sector, that these kinds of uh, examples would continue. One other uh, small point as well, and it depends how, what the minister means here about ring fencing. It should be very clear about saying there needs to be ring fencing of funding. Uh, for uh, areas of particular acute housing needs. So that would be places like North Belfast, West Belfast and, and uh, uh, Derry, London Derry. And in those circumstances, if the housing executive is moved over to the uh, private sector um, and a lack of control, the minister would not be able to, it, it, it would be able to give funding to the housing executive, but not to actually stipulate what that funding would be for. So the ring fencing would become much more difficult under reclassification. Next slide, please. So tenants' rights, and at this point, I will admit, I, I, I am not a legal expert um, uh, in terms of the detail of uh, the legalities around tenancies. Um, it, it would, it, if you wanted to go further on it, it would be good to maybe to get somebody who is a legal expert on these. What, uh, two points that I would uh, briefly make though on it. Um, in relation to a comparison between housing associations and the housing executive, housing associations in Northern Ireland have three types of tenancies, introductory, secured and unsecured. The housing executive only have the first two, introductory and secured. Again, the worry would be that in the process of moving the housing executive over, the, the potential change can happen in relation to tenancies uh, and there may be an introduction or an, a, a, a greater use of unsecured tenancies uh, further down the line, not saying necessarily immediately, but further down the line. This is again based on the experience of what's happened in, in, in Britain over the years. Um, uh, secondly, tenants rights though don't just rely upon actually what's in the tenancy and there is discussion because we're talking about co-ops and mutuals here about participation and the role that tenants can have in relation to uh, engaging with uh, their landlord. Of course, we currently have a democratically controlled uh, housing executive with democratic accountability exercised on, uh, on the minister, input from local authorities as well in terms of the uh, Northern Ireland uh, Housing Council. And um, often though, when we look at co-ops, there is a promise that there would be more pr uh, participation. It doesn't necessarily come through though in terms of more control by the tenants themselves. This is a quote from a piece of research done a couple of years ago, looking at community led, uh, housing. And of course, we're not talking necessarily about community led housing here. We're talking about a, an organization uh, from the top down in relation to moving the housing executive over to uh, 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 being reclassified into the private sector. Community led uh, co ops and mutuals are often on a much, much smaller scale. 
uh, and um, uh, uh, allow a small group of people to come together to actually uh, run their local area. Here, though, we have an example of a Steve, a tenant in a, in a co-op saying the participation does seem quite high. Uh, we've been given a strategic role, but when it comes to key decision making, uh, operational or in relation to rents and regeneration, the tenants actually are not included in, the, in, in that. Uh, those kind of key uh, operational uh, um, uh, decisions. Uh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, we can see this again in relation to some of the one of the housing mutuals I did some work on a few years ago uh, in Wales, where they have a specific uh, um, a specific policy to transfer council housing over to housing mutuals. In, in this example, in this case, the tenants in the housing mutual only get uh, a third of the voting rights. There's a complicated system with multiple constituencies including people who have uh, who are not tenants or employees of the organization who are involved um, uh, and uh, get to to vote over the uh, the makeup of the boards now in this case there were tenants on the board in other cases tenants are not actually on the board and even if they're on the board of directors they're not there as representatives of the tenants they're there as directors of the uh, of the company. Uh, or the uh, the housing association, and here we have an example. Of this I thought one of the tenants in uh, the Gower example uh, really kind of hit the nail on the head for me. She said, "What I find appalling is that we're moving to something out of democratic control." And they keep saying to us, "But we're not for profit." That's not the point. It still isn't the same level of democratic control. Uh, next slide, please. Just the last couple of slides here to look at the question of accountability and that kind of leads in from what we were just talking about in terms of tenants rights and tenants participation. And there is little doubt as a, 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 that there is a form of uh, everyday accountability that public housing has, whether it's local council housing or whether it's uh, the housing executive in the case of, of uh, in the case of Northern Ireland. Uh, this everyday accountability comes in because it's under democratic control because, and, and you will know this as, uh, as councillors, you can go to the housing executive and you can actually intervene on behalf of tenants uh, and constituents, and actually you will get a hearing, right? Uh, and so this is, again, this is from uh, a, a piece of work I did on uh, one of the Scottish transfers a few years back, right? And this is uh, one of the um, Unison Trade Union activists where he said, we've always said that we've got an accountable landlord, uh, because the councillors can actually represent their members and they will get a hearing and they'll get listened to in the housing departments, in the housing offices, by the housing executive. So this everyday accountability, in that sense, if the housing department fails to address your complaint properly, you can go to a councillor and the councillor can act on, uh, on, your, on your behalf. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, we, and actually we know this and you, I, I've I've heard experience from talking to councillors uh, actually across these islands where when you're dealing with housing associations, it is not the same. They do not respond in the same way and they feel that they don't have to, and indeed they don't have to, because they're in the private sector, they're not accountable to local, uh, uh, locally elected representatives. Uh, and just really to finish off in terms of the accountability kinds of setup here, this was, Rochdale was set up in a very specific set of circumstances that fit Rochdale to, to a degree. Remember, Rochdale is the birthplace of the cooperative movement, the mutual movement. So, the, so they were able to tap into those kinds of ideas when it came to actually setting up uh, Rochdale Borough Wide Housing and transferring all the council housing from Rochdale Council over to it. But here we've got, we need to be careful about how the accountability mechanisms work. So the board of directors at Rochdale is set up as eight non-executive directors and two executive directors. None of them, as far as I'm aware, are tenants. The eight, um, currently, they have six uh, NEDs on there. One's an accountant, an ex-police officer, a chief executive for a Northwest charity, a finance director on a housing, other housing association, social research analyst, and a professor of social change. 
they don't specify actually whether or not they are uh, in the accounts, whether or not they are actually tenants. I think it's I think it's unlikely. Uh, what they do have is a is a representative body that is made up of fifteen elected tenants, eight elected employees, and a further eight nominated representatives. They act as an advisory board, uh, uh, advisory group to the board of directors. It is the board of the directors that makes the decision about regeneration, about knocking down the seven sisters and only replacing them with 120 homes, etc. And they have two different types of membership. They've got tenant membership and employee membership. Uh, the, no, the tenant membership actually has gone up by about 10% over, uh, over the last few years. But uh, while the employee membership actually has gone down uh, marginally over the last few years uh, as well. So what's happening here is we're changing the way that tenants actually engage with their landlord, whereas at the moment we'd say they are citizens receiving a public service. Now, uh, under the move to a not-for-profit company, they would see themselves as shareholders within that uh, organisation, uh, electing directors who would then run the uh, the housing organisation much more along commercial business lines, which is something maybe we can talk about a bit more later on. Um, uh, and just to echo something that, uh, just to finish off the last slide, uh, just to echo something that uh, Sheena said earlier as well, we have a bespoke specific um, a solution to public housing in Northern Ireland that fits the context, the history of Northern Ireland. It is the housing executive, and I think we we need to we need to find ways, obviously, to fund that. But we tinkle with, by changing and reforming that. We do that at our peril, um, uh, and I uh, I'm very concerned about that potential move to uh, reclassifying it into the private sector for accounting purposes, because it opens up a whole range of other processes that, uh, if we look at Britain, have not been beneficial to the, the whole population when it comes to accessing public housing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Sheena, again. I'm now in the hands of members and I'm in the chat box. So far, I have no member of the committee wishing to respond to either of the presentations. I see Stephen and Tina sitting there. We're going to get away in light here, you're thinking. Uh, members, are there any questions for either Stephen or Tina? Uh, Mr. Riley? Yeah, thanks, Chair, uh, for bringing me in, and thanks to both Sheena and uh, Stuart for the presentations here this afternoon. Very interesting, and getting them in advance, as always, is very uh, productive and useful for us to uh, to digest and to go through. I suppose uh, the, the question I had uh, in relation to this, Chair, is um, in relation to the tenants and the people uh, uh, who who work in the housing executive and in other places and and the research that has been carried out um, is consultation with those um, those people directly affected by these types of decisions factored in uh, and if so what parameters uh, around those consultations uh, have uh, have people found most useful that's just a question for now chair thanks thank you go ahead uh, Stuart or Sheena. Stuart, will I go first? It would just keep yeah, order, yeah. yeah. Um, that's something we've met with the minister now twice, and we're meeting with the department again, actually later this week. And that is something that's at the fore now. Detail is very, very scant uh, in terms of you know when, when this process is going to progress beyond you know the statement that was actually released in November. So unfortunately, we don't have any details yet. They reassure anyone, either our own members. Or the public, but you'll be aware of how much input we've had in terms of campaigning and trying to get the best result for existing housing executive tenants. Now, it's unusual for a trade union to do that, but that's how passionate we are about this and about protecting the housing executive and the future and what it could be if it was financed appropriately. Um, but we would be insisting, you know, there would be a tenant ballot and full consultation. There, there has been said the consultation of some kind will take place, but we would like a firm response in terms of that and uh, being prioritised because tenants 
uh, are the most important stakeholder in this whole event. Thank you, Shina. Stephen? Yeah, um, uh, again, to echo uh, Shina's point, I think um, the consultation that needs to happen um, it needs to follow along the lines of what's actually happened uh, over the water in Britain in, in uh, where we've had these kinds of transfers and reclassifications, and that's basically where we have a ballot. You know, this is this is what we had uh, with the small scale stock transfers that were proposed in um, Ballyclare and Ballymena, um, where there is a period of consultation where uh, with the tenants where the uh, plans are explained, there are doc there's documentation that's put forward, uh, there's a debate that happens in public meetings, etc. Um, and then there's a, a clear ballot that's actually taken uh, and the tenants themselves decide what the future should be of the uh, the housing executive. This is uh, this has become standard cost uh, uh, standard practice uh, whenever there's been these transfers uh, over in Britain. Um, uh, and I think that's something that we, we should all be uh, urging the minister to do um, if these if this policy is uh, is pursued further. You're on mute there, Derek. My apologies. Um, I was saying Alderman Bresland um, has declared an interest. Can that be noted, please? Uh, Councillor Donnelly seeking to come in. Uh, thanks, Chair. And I'd like to thank Sheena and Stuart for the, the, the presentation. Uh, there's a, a lot of a lot of things to ponder there. There's a lot of information that, that I wasn't aware of. Uh, Supposing my naivety when this was announced initially, I, I, you know, thought that that it could have been a positive thing that that maybe the the housing executive would be properly financed. Uh, the more I hear about this, the more concerns that I have. Uh, I have concerns about you know a number of things that that you've mentioned there, particularly about housing associations not having filled the gap concerns about you know the, the, the and I've witnessed this less service and rights uh, for tenants I, I, I've witnessed that by my dealings and comparing my dealings with housing executive tenants and uh, housing association uh, tenants the the less democratic nature of it and one of the one of the important things for tenants here housing executive tenants is that you know they can uh, ring up or contact their local representative elected representative who can intervene and the housing executive you know have a great uh, rapport with with uh, elected reps right across you know the the community and you hear that uh, you know you, you witness that uh, the, the there is a lack of accountability with the, the housing associations uh, you know they're not subject to uh, FOI requests and you know i think that there's a lot of information here that needs to be going out and and you know the the consultation in my view is very very important i think you know that if it's possible with sheena and stuart and people like that you know there needs to be an information campaign there needs to be that information needs to be getting to the the uh the elected reps but more importantly it needs to be going to the tenants and as elected rep, anything I can do to, to help out in that, you know, uh, uh, you know, and, and I would like to see possibly if we could have maybe, you know, a meeting, obviously it have to be virtual given the circumstances we're in. But you see the, the, the people in Britain who've already lived this or who are living that, I think it's important that we get that input for me as, a, as, a, as an elected rep. So I can then, you know, pass that on to, to as, a, as, a, as a housing uh, executive tenant myself. But I'd like to thank you for. All right. Are, your, your are we moving to a question? Are we moving no, to I, a question? I, I, I don't have a question, other than can is it possible that that you know what I've outlined there can that be set up where further uh, you know information campaigns or a possible Zoom meeting from people who who uh, have felt this at first hand in Britain? Thank you. Uh, you have that at the tail end there, uh, Stuart and Sheena. 
I'm, I'm, I have two others looking to come in. I'm going to bring them in. You can keep that question in mind. And remember, I'm looking for questions rather than uh, a lot of comment members. Uh, so, uh, uh, Councillor Harkin, not on the committee, but come ahead, uh, Councillor Harkin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I do have several questions, um, <clears throat> and I, I, I can't second Gary's proposal there, but I think that that would be a worthwhile proposal to have uh, to invite dollars uh, uh, from, from Rochdale and Glasgow uh, and other places who've had experience with this. Um, uh, you know, Stuart uh, has led the way in a lot of in a, in a lot of ways in terms of research into social housing, and, uh, and you can kind of see that from the work that he, he has been able to share with us today in terms of these questions um, and the expertise. And Sheena, of course, uh, has been uh, one of the leading on the ground campaigners defending um, the uh, housing executive over many, many years uh, and defending tenants' rights and workers' rights as well. Um, and I, I, I just want to mention that I, I, you know, I also welcome the fact that the trade union uh, councils from across the north have joined the Dancer Band Council now in uh, opposing this plan to privatise the uh, housing executive. Um, so my, my questions are this for, for Stuart and Sheena or, or anybody who wants to have a look at them. I mean, sometimes people will say, well, what's your alternative? Um, because, uh, you know, it's been, the housing executive has been allowed to be degraded uh, for the last 20 years. So where, what's your proposal for funding? Uh, you know, because Stuart mentioned there that, uh, and it's an alarming figure, that 300 million was handed out of public money to housing associations. But we're, we're often told there is no money for the housing executive. Um, and that, uh, you know, but, uh, so, you know, I know there was plans to cut the corporation tax by 300 million a year. To my mind, 100 million could have been taken out of the block grant, grant over the last decade and given to the housing executive to let it build houses and renovate. Um, but how would you answer that question? Uh, the second one is uh, just on, um, uh, you know, we, we, we heard a bit about work tenants' rights. Maybe, Sheena, if you could talk a bit about uh, how workers' rights will be impacted in this, because, okay, you know, there are tens of many, many thousands of workers that work for the housing executive uh, as well. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I think that this is a, a very, very important issue. Um, that's why we're talking about it, because there's an urgent crisis here to end the housing crisis. Um, and it was urgent last year. It was urgent the year before. Um, and I think that we, we can end the housing crisis, but I think it's crucial that we actually protect the housing executive as a public body and let the housing executive take the lead in and building all the thousands of new houses that we need. Uh, you know, in Derry and, and uh, all, you know, all the other places where there's a crisis right now and a shortage. So thanks again to the presentations and thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Harkin. Uh, I, I see another two to come in. Uh, so if Sandra and Paul can hold on, uh, I'll take those uh, two contributions first, uh, Stuart and Shana. Um, in terms of Councillor Harkin's questions there, for funding for the housing executive, we, we would love to be directly involved in that. Uh, of course we would, but we don't don't have that gift. You, you're in a position to do something about that as elected elected public representatives in terms of uh, what, what you can do and your parties, what they can do in Stormont and the funding that can be requested. That's a constant question we're asking and what we're told is health and education are their priority. But it's back to front because housing is always going to be the foundation block for accessing both of those things and for having better mental health, better physical health, access to education, further and higher education. So why why not start at, at the beginning and fully fund, fund housing either through the block grant? But I know some people are the chief executive and Professor Roberts are here today and they are well aware of what the housing executive is worth. It's worth 3.25 billion in terms of the stock, the offices and the land that the, it owns currently. So as we, we discussed this last week with the chair and with the chief executive, that's a hell of a lot of collateral to borrow upon in the first place. So it should put them in a privileged position in order to do this. Now, some people have talked about ideologies, um, but I'm sure everybody here in terms of councillors Probably one of your top two things that people come to you about is probably a housing issue, either getting access to housing or needing transferred. So if that's such a priority,
priority, and which it is because there's almost 30,000 people on the waiting list, then it's a priority for all of us and we all have a responsibility to act and ensure it is fully funded. And that is something that we must tackle and it, it must happen now because this situation is only getting worse. And it's an easy option to privatise something or to hive it off. And we don't have any guarantees in the future. While the statement looks good on paper and it could sound good and I appreciate people are coming from different levels of experience, but what happens in 18 months time when there could be a new minister in post and they have a different view of this and the housing executive is unrecognisable from what we have currently, or, but more importantly, what we could have if it was financed appropriately from the start. Stuart, I'll let you come in there. Yeah, uh, Grant, first of all, to Councillor Donnelly, um, yeah, that would be uh, that would be great um, to get the experience to hear directly from uh, both tenants and activists uh, from from Britain. One of the other things I would say as well is, of course, uh, I've written three reports for NIPSA on this, and actually a lot of that is contained in those reports. So I encourage you to go and uh, to read those uh, to read those reports. Uh, they're freely available on the on the NIPSA website. Um, in, in terms of Councillor Harkin's questions, you know, what's the alternative? I, 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 three things very quickly to say this. First of all, look, I think you're quite right. There are political choices to be made here. Um, I think it was about two weeks after the minister made the announcement uh, about the importance of the housing executive, the importance of social housing, public housing. And uh, she made an announcement that she was going to give 145 million uh, uh, pounds over to co-ownership. Now, co-ownership, uh, indeed, as has been highlighted, some of you may have picked up the accents, and I actually live in Dublin, despite working in Birmingham, co-ownership has been highlighted down here, uh, and indeed in Britain, as a way of subsidising developers. It keeps housing prices artificially high. Right? Um, there's 145 million that could have gone straight away to the housing executive instead. That would have bought, uh, because we're looking at a shortfall of about 100 million, according to the minister's statement, on an annual basis. That's 18 months worth of maintenance that could have been implemented straight away. We could be doing that now, uh, fitting the new kitchens and bathrooms and doing the roofs and so on uh, now. It was a political choice. So, uh, And there are other political choices around that. The crux of this matter, though, the second point is, we need to find a way of changing. I don't think we need to uh, to be smart about this or uh, just acquiesce to it. We need to find a way of changing the government rules in relation to borrowing, or at least the way that they are applied to the housing executive. Um, and indeed, if we had 18 months breathing space, we would actually be in a position to start to put together plans and negotiations with, uh, uh, with the Treasury and with the ONS and I would say, look, we should be looking for a derogation. Uh, we've had a derogation in relation to um, uh, the extension of universal uh, uh, universal credit uh, and, uni and the welfare reforms in, into Northern Ireland. We should have the same thing in relation to the housing executive. And that's a basis on which we can then actually start to uh, negotiate with the, uh, uh, with the powers in Westminster and say we need funding for the housing executive because of the specific circumstances, because of uh, uh, the history and the context in relation to, to Northern Ireland. And the other one then, the, the third point is just to say, to argue for more direct funding for housing. Right? Um, one of the things that's happened, we're in the process of rolling out city region deals. One of the things that's happened in terms of the, some of those city region deals in England is that they've, they've the authorities there, the local authorities there, have negotiated with uh, the Treasury to get funding specifically for housing and social housing. For example, Cambridge City Council, right? No big, you know, not a big metropolitan, you know, labour based council, but Cambridge City Council was able to negotiate uh, 60 million funding direct for council housing. That's the kind of thing, you know, that we should be looking at as being smart in terms of using what's available to us in relation to the uh, the funding that Westminster is willing to give and leverage it to uh, um, get more funding that can be put into the housing executive. So I would say there are political choices to make. We get, we need to seek a derogation uh, now to uh, to allow the housing executive to borrow. Uh, at least in the short term, and then we should be arguing for more direct funding for housing for a whole range of reasons as well. We know the stimulus that 
direct funding in, uh, in housing can have as well in an economy. Uh, Stephen, thank you. Um, I, I'm mindful of time, members, because we have another presentation also, and I, I know that our next present presentation uh, actually has a time, a cutoff time. So, um, you know, can, can we keep the questions uh, succinct and can we keep the replies succinct? Uh, I'm moving to Sandra, then Paul, then Patricia. Uh, so, uh, Councillor Duffy. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in, and thank you to the presenters for um, their, their presentations. They were very informative, and I do appreciate where they're coming from. Um, there was a significant amount of assumptions being made within some of the presentations, I felt. I do really understand the concerns and the issues that are being raised. I have worked in a housing setting, I work in homelessness, and I have done so for over 20 years. So I am well aware of, of the issues that are being presented. In terms of what the minister has been proposing, it is nothing. It is not a privatisation of the housing executive, um, and it's certainly not her intention that, 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 that that's part of her plans. It'll be of no surprise to anybody here that I support um, the minister in terms of the presentation that she has made. Um, if we are going to tackle the growing waiting list and provide support to people who are currently homeless, we really need to be looking at transformational change within the housing executive. Um, we, we need more homes to be built. We need them to be built in areas where, where they're needed. We need the essential maintenance to be carried out um, to bring homes up to standards. Stuart, you mentioned in terms of the ring fencing of money um, for specific areas with high um, needs in terms of housing. And I completely welcome the fact that Jerry was one of the, the areas that was identified. And as a council, I believe we should be working with the minister and working with the housing executive to ensure that that happens. Um, from my conversations uh, with um, the department, with the minister, um, I can see that it, it's to call this, to brand this as privatisation is inaccurate. The minister is being very clear that tenants' rights and workers' rights are going to be central to the whole process. Um, Sheena, I think you alluded to the fact that you have already met with the, with the minister in terms of it because at the very core of what she's doing, she wants to make sure that she gets this right. There has been no decision taken as yet in terms of mutual or cooperation or what that looks like. She has tasked her department to go out, to look at what the options are and to bring those options back to her. And at the core of that, she, she wants the tenants' rights to be at the core of them. She wants to retain the benefits of public ownership and she wants the, the best interests of the workers as well to be at the core of that. So do you see where, I, where I'm coming from at the minute? I, I'm sitting, we're sitting looking at waiting lists across the north, people in housing stress, over 30,000 people sitting in housing stress. I don't believe a do nothing approach is what we can do. For over 20 years, I've worked in the housing executive and I have heard the same issues. This is the first time- Question, Councillor Duffy. Yeah, I'm commenting. This is the first time in 20 years I have actually seen a proposal on the table to tackle the issues that we have. And I know that um, Councillor Harkin got to part of my question first in terms of what else we can do or what, and some of the suggestions have come back and I appreciate that, but that it's highly unlikely that we would take money from health at this stage to, for housing. That's not going to happen. And you're right, it is a political decision, but could you imagine the political backlash if you took money out of the health service? You know, we have had an underfunding of all these services, all these departments, for many, many years, we have had underfunding of the block grant. We have had so finance is an issue, and in terms of the degradation, we're not going to get that under a, a, a Tory government. It's not going to happen. I suppose because um, that question was already asked, I will ask the question to Clark Bailey um, and representatives from the housing executive here, who will be operating under the new system. What their views are in terms of the proposals being put forward by the minister. Thank you. Got there in the end. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Duffy. Um, I have two more uh, contributions to keep that question in mind from uh, Councillor Duffy. Uh, Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Chair, for letting us in. And thanks, everyone, for the presentations. Uh, and, and like some other members, when we, uh, when we first heard this announced, and we've seen some language around cooperatives we were uh, um, we were picked up 
and and says mm, looking at the possibilities of this but as we look further on this hi and, and we've seen we've seen a couple of years previously we've seen the housing executive trying to transfer their stock to housing associations and that failed <clears throat> the reason that failed was the tenants didn't want it didn't want it i uh, and they they wanted and needed to stay in the public sector and that's what tenants wanted so and as a failure of that process then we come out with this reclassifying and we hear uh government ministers uh talking about allowing to borrow and i think i think come back to what councillor duffy says there i think that's a trap that we have fallen into for years borrowing the government has a responsibility to its citizens and we know one of the core tenants of any family life is a home as a house that's where that's where life and the community starts and government has a responsibility to this but we fell into the trap of saying about blocking the allowance of borrowing the housing executive should be given the money full stop let's not stop let's not start getting into the scenarios around who's allowed to borrow and who's not this fancy words around cooperative is only only around privatization that's it now when we look about and we hear and we've heard there previously from sandra saying workers rights will be guaranteed and tenants rights will be guaranteed and then we just look back a couple of years and we see the fresh start and then we see where was the frontline workers guarantees there they went clean out the wonder 20 000 frontline workers gone no guarantees whatsoever so if we fall into this trap and we go down this road we will see the houses egg of stock getting cleared out once this privatization has taken place so i think that's another her question I, I think that just on, on the back of what councillor Domi says i would like to second the proposal for us to get more information on how we can as public representatives effectively take this forward to block it thank you sure. uh that's a proposal in the second uh to invite others i presume was originally councillor donnelly's proposal is that correct is that what you're seconding country gallery uh, uh look before i move to you patricia we have a proposal in front of us uh, I, I want to clear that perhaps first uh is there any objection to that from any member of the committee Can Chair, just seek clarification on what the proposal is from the member, and perhaps it could be put into the chat box. Right. Uh, Councillor Donnelly, can you do that? And uh, I'll go to Councillor Logue and we'll come back to that proposal. Okay, okay. okay. Get it into the chat box, uh, Councillor Donnelly. It's already seconded, so we can take that forward once Patricia has asked her question. Councillor Logue. Chair, I have to say thank you very much. I'm not a member of this committee, but I have to say uh, what I have to say, it's it's not a question. Maybe some of the presenters will take a question out of it, but I just want to be very brief if you will just allow me to proceed, uh, Chair. I'll give First you a wee bit of leeway. I want to say I'm absolutely flabbergasted that a proposal has been second that uh, more information more information is brought to councillors in order to block something. Certainly bring all information that we can. But if we are bringing that information with our minds already brought up, then we are very short sighted. I want to thank the, the two presenters and just a just a couple of comments, you know, um, I, I, along with my other colleagues, have worked uh, with and continue to work with the housing executive and the housing associations. And we do represent those, uh, our constituents in all those uh, sectors, should it be private uh, or social housing, whether it's association or housing executive, we are afforded that right. 
But I just want to finish off, uh, Chair, by saying, look, what the minister has brought forward here is a proposal. Uh, and it's just a proposal to do something about it. It's not, it's not written that this is what I am doing. She has committed to work with all stakeholders, including the unions, including uh, the tenants, including all uh, people who are interested in addressing this much needed um, issue, especially in our council district. As far as I'm aware, uh, the, uh, options are being worked up. And I'm sure, uh, uh, I think Stuart, for his insight, you know, there probably has been models that have been gone before, but surely all that wrong can be, uh, it can be ensured that whatever model, if it is accepted, that those things that have gone wrong in the, in the past are not repeated in the future. And I just want to reiterate what my party colleague Sandra has said. We are managing a, a, a very, very depleted pot of money, which has been annually depleted year on year. Our health service needs completely overhauled. Our education sector, the whole, everything. And, you know, for to, to come up with just the proposal that a, a political decision needs to be uh, to give the money to build houses would be reckless at this time. We need to come up with models that can work for everyone. And I would suggest that everybody wait, put their input into what uh, is suggested uh, by the minister, uh, what consultations there's going to be, and hopefully we can get this right collectively. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Logue. Stout defence of your minister there. Uh, I suppose what, what you are referring to is, is what the terminology that's already been used there. Uh, somebody suggested the transformational change. Uh, perhaps that's what we're looking at, transformational change on the back of the minister declaring that there, there, there will be a change, but what the nature of that change is. Um, I know there's a question to to Clark there, um, Chief Executive, um, do, do the Chief Executive or my iPods are about to get down here. Do the Chief Executive or uh, Chairperson of NIAT uh, wish to come, come in briefly there? Thank you. Yeah, can I, can I start, uh, please, if you don't mind? It's uh, Professor Roberts, Professor Peter Roberts, I'm the Chair. Uh, that's okay, uh, Professor Roberts. Thank you. Yeah, fine. Uh, first of all, can I can I put my cards on the table and say that I would welcome the opportunity to uh, argue my case uh, and the case of uh, for a transformational change. I I do um, find myself in the position where I could go through all sorts of small points, but I would really welcome the opportunity to have the same. Um, it, courtesy and right that you've afforded to Sheena and Stuart, and I don't want to nitpick uh, because I think what I would want to do is to say that there are alternatives and it is not black and white. There are ways of doing this. The second point I think which I'd like to make is that I've actually done this directly. I was tasked by uh, a Labour minister, John Healy, with trying to sort out a problem of a, in a big housing estate in Newcastle, and we have created a very successful mutual on that estate, and the tenants and the employees do control it and do direct it. And my experience uh, has been all the way through this that it's about how you write the rules, how you write the terms and conditions, how you set the board up, how you set the accountability up, which is important. My third point uh, is that uh, it is not a privatization in any con meaningful or conventional sense. Uh, and I, like you, would campaign 
I will join a campaign against privatization. I'll give you now my solemn promise that if this turns out as privatization, it will not be with me as chair of the housing executive, because like you, I am not interested in creating something which actually exploits a public resource which has been paid for from the public purse. The final point I would make, and you can probably sense that I feel very strongly about this, is that uh, if we actually look at the uh, arrangements currently, then the housing executive literally does not have the money to either maintain its existing uh, stock um, at the level that we wish. But can, can you can you hold for a moment, yeah. uh, Peter? Yeah. Peter, yeah. there's a member seeking a point of order. Unfortunately, Councillor Harkin, uh, you're not a member of the committee. If somebody else wishes to raise a point of order who's on the committee, uh, that's fair enough. Uh, but uh, I am overruling that because you're not a member of the committee. But uh, if somebody else wishes to come in and specify the point that the point of order has been brought in, I'm, I'm content with that. Um, okay. Uh, Councillor McCann, similarly, uh, not at this stage. Uh, you can come in with a question. I'll revert back to uh, the chairperson of the housing executive, if yeah. you will, Professor Roberts. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Just very, very briefly. I don't want to. I just simply. I'm asking for the the right to do the same as uh, Stuart and Sheena have done, and that is to produce a properly structured brief presentation. Can I just make the final point? The housing executive has not tried to divest itself of stock to housing associations. Uh, I've been told off because the housing executive uh, provided detailed factual information for tenants, and the fact that the tenants voted against transfer to the housing associations actually caused uh, the board and many of the staff in the housing executive great pleasure. We were very keen to keep our tenants. We do not want to divest of stock. And that has stopped. And I'm really pleased that it has happened because it's the result of representations which I and other people in the housing executive have made. So let's get that out of the way. I think, uh, Councillor Gallagher, uh, you know, we did not encourage the divesting of stock to housing associations. And my, my point, though, is that I would love the opportunity to give you not the other side of the coin, but a different interpretation of what is meant by the minister's statement. And you know uh, Karen Hooland as well as I do. And I, I am sure that the intention there is not to, to put it crudely, is not to privatize, but it is to make sure we can protect our existing homes and we can meet the genuine housing needs of many people in Northern Ireland. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be quiet now. I don't know whether Clark thank, is to add anything. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Roberts. Um, th there's quite a bit of activity developing on the chat box. Uh, Clark, there had been a, a direct question to yourself there as CE. Do, do you wish to comment on the direct question? I, I think I'd certainly um, stand with the chairman and asking if the council would be kind enough to invite us back. Um, I think some of the information is potentially misleading that you've heard today. Um, I think there is there is a consensus. Oh, I'm losing the, the signal. Hopefully you can still hear me. Hopefully you can still hear me. I'm losing the... Yeah, the, I can hear you. I can go ahead. I think there, there is a real sense that everybody wants the best for our tenants and everybody wants the best for the housing executive. But the NIPSA proposals... Uh, you've gone now, Clark. Uh, not sure what's happened. Could somebody in IT check on that? Gremlins in the works. Uh, I'll I'll come back to Clark. Chair. I apologize Sorry. this oh, connection is oh. coming tonight. Chair. I think there oh, is a, fund Sorry. There's Sorry, a fundamental Sorry. question. Chair, just as, as a point, Clark, maybe if you switch off the video, you, you, might, you might get a better reception. Your video? 
Yeah. Thanks, Paul. I don't know. Can you still hear me? Yeah, go ahead. I think the fun the fundamental question is how do we close the gap between the money we have and the money we need? Uh, go on again. Maybe, Chair, I could finish the point that Clark's trying to make. Can you hear uh, me? Sorry, sorry Professor Roberts. Uh, I think listening to what we're, we have been listening to, and there is a proposal that I have to take here, uh, Professor Roberts, um, we're, we're looking at a minister wasn't to make changes, and a lot of the debate seems to me to be how will those changes be enacted, and uh, you know for the benefit of all. But there are concerns that have already been expressed by this council. Now, I hear the request from the Housing Executive that they be afforded the opportunity to uh, make a proposal. That's fair enough. I'll put it to the committee uh, when we have dealt with the previous businesses sitting here. Um, so I'll start uh, by clearing the backlog on the chat box. Um, there is a proposal which has, amended, which has been amended. Uh, by Councillor Duffy. Uh, the no, I have a, a further amendment. That's not my amendment. <laughs> well, that's not your right. Uh, Councillor Donnelly, can you clarify? Is that your proposal? Chair, that's my proposal. What happened in the middle of typing it out, it had to send uh, inadvertently. Okay. So I just added that on to finish it off. And that is the proposal that Councillor Gallagher is seconding. Is that correct, Councillor Gallagher? Yes, it is, Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, I suppose I, I don't think there's any need to speak to them to the proposal, Councillor Donnelly. It's fairly straightforward. Would Straight you agree? Forward, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Duffy. You're suggesting an amendment. Yes, I have it in the chat box. I'll just press send. There it is. There. So if uh, if that could be inserted um, after housing models to make, so if it could be put in there to make a, a presentation to government and strategic plan. Thank you, Councillor Duffy, and, and that actually means that I don't have to bring it back to committee if that can be brought in, that we're hearing all sides of the story. Uh, can that be added as Sorry, your amendment is proposed. Is it seconded by a member of committee? Chair, could I come in first? Chair? Uh, sorry, hold, hold, country gallery. I want to check if the amendment is being seconded. Uh, country Cooper is seconding that as a committee member. Uh, can that be typed up, please? Country gallery, quick comment while we're waiting on it being typed up. You're muted. Paul, you're muted. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair. Chair, just from what I see and, and, and from today's procedure, I think that they need to be separated. I think that we have a delegation from one. I, on a different day, we have one from the House of Secretaries. I don't think that, and when this original proposal came uh, before us, this <coughs> wasn't to have a debate within this virtual chamber versus one against the other. I think that. We listened to your presentation as in the, the the proposal and then if someone else wants to make a proposal we have a second delegation on a different day um country Geller, i take what you're saying i'm waiting for the proposal to go on screen but as i'm reading it at the moment there's a request for two delegations and i don't see a request that they be on the same day and i appreciate the point that you're making that they could be taken separately uh or you know that the second delegation would be excluded during uh, the presentation from the whatever. Um, take that on board, but I'm willing for that to be. It's been proposed. The amendment's been proposed and seconded. I'm waiting for that to go on screen so that we can all clearly see what is being proposed and seconded. Chair, I ask uh, clarification: Is is the the proposer of the amendment saying that we have it's in separate days? Or is the proposal that it's the same meeting at the same time? 
I'm 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 fine with it being in separate days. I just think okay. it's important that both sides are are heard. Uh, I would tend to agree with uh, the proposal of the amendment. It's always good to hear both sides of a debate. Uh, well, they're not just heard two separate sides. Uh, well, if you look at the proposal, uh, we haven't had a full. I mean, the the housing executive haven't come with a prepared presentation. No, but and, it may be very, and, give, give us a very and, and order by the people who order. Order, and we are looking at a proposal in front of us, um, which has been proposed. In front of uh, Country Donnelly, are you content that with the understanding that we're looking at two separate uh, days for these, or separate times, not necessarily days, but separate times? Are you content with the amendment? I, I wouldn't uh, attempt to stop anybody getting a side of the story across. So if it's two Thank separate things, I have no problem with. Thank you, Councillor Donnelly. So the proposal is before you members uh, seconded as amended. Councillor Geller, are you are you content with the amendment on the conditions that we have discussed? Yes. yes. Thank you, members. Is there anybody wishes to vote against this amendment? Or sorry, this proposal as amended. Chair, it's it's Councillor Riley here. Um, I I don't intend to vote against the amendment, but I had indicated I wanted to speak because I have a further amendment. <laughs> uh, so if I, I'll allow you to deal with the the amendment that's on the floor, but I do wish to come again before we vote on the substantive proposal. Thank, thank you, Councillor Riley. Um, any member against? I don't hear any. I'm now taking that as the substantive motion, which Councillor Riley wishes to further amend. Councillor Riley. Yeah, thanks, Chair, for bringing me back in, and I'll table the amendment now in the chat box. Uh, so, if you give me a minute, I'll I'll put it in and I'll speak to it, please. Oh. <coughs> So, Chair, I've just put it into the chat box there, and it's just, um, I suppose, reiterate the point I made when I was asking a question right back at the start. Um, you know, I, I welcome the fact that we've heard both from uh, Sheena and Nipsa and Stuart uh, as, uh, as well in relation to their views, and it's great to have Clark, uh, Bailey, and others from the House Executive on this afternoon, uh, not only to hear from them, but I think it's important that they hear from us about the value that we as local councillors have in the housing executive as it sits currently, the accountability that the housing executive as a government body uh, has and, and how we as local councillors can shape uh, the work that they do. Uh, and it is important uh, that that public service ethos that's in the housing executive currently uh, you know is included in the future of the executive in whatever way that takes so i think it's incumbent upon us as local councillors to try and protect that accountability and to do so in conjunction with the staff who work in the organization and the tenants of the housing executive so that's why we've added in that uh, that any changes that may come the way of the housing executive that the, the very people directly affected are afforded their chance to have their say so that amendment is in the chat box chair which i hope will get approval today thank you uh thank you councillor Riley. i'm very remiss i didn't seek a seconder for that before you talked <laughs> to the proposal. I'll give you a seconder, Chair. Uh, it has been seconded. Sorry, who seconded there? Councillor Mooney, was it? Councillor Mooney, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mooney. Members, you now have. Chair, just a point of order, Chair. Amended. Uh, point of order from. Sorry, who's the point of order from? Councillor Gallagher. Councillor Gallagher. Just, uh, under what standing order, Councillor Gallagher? I haven't got it here in front of me, Chair, but just on on the on the on the issue of how, how does that sit with, with the previous motion that's the corporate position of council that, that was proposed in the first place can i can i come on that because i actually don't see it in the order order um the question has been asked on a point of order 
Can I ask the chief executive, as we don't have our, our uh, bill up here, can the chief executive clarify that, please? Thank you, Chair. I must. Sorry, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I'm assuming Councillor Gallagher's point of order is in respect of Councillor Riley's uh, amendment. Is that? I, I'm assuming that also. Yes. Okay. I'm just looking at the original notice of motion, which is that um, Council will write to the Minister for Communities make it clear its opposition to plans to restructure the housing executive away from a public body to a privatized mutual slash cooperative model. I'm sorry, the, um, the amendment has now disappeared off the screen, so I'm trying to compare it. Uh, it's in the chat box. <laughs> um, and recognizes any move to transform the housing executive into a mutual cooperative model should be done with consultation. Well, members, my read of that is it's not a direct negative. Um, it's council has stated its opposition to a privatized mutual cooperative model. model. <laughs> and it seems to say that any move to do that should be done with consultation. So it's not negating, it's not negating the first of the, the current position of council. Uh, thank you for that clarification, Chief Executive. Uh, Mr. Gallagher, are you content? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Duffy, um, you wish to come in on the amendment, I presume? I, I was just I was just making the point that the motion was around privatisation. This is not around privatisation, and I think that's why it's important that we hear back from um, Peter and Clark in relation to to their views on it. Well, that, that that's already yeah. that's already in the proposal. And I, I just wanted to make this comment. I apologize for my spelling mistakes in the, the chat box. I'm partially sighted and can't see the chat box. So I apologize. It's on the big screen that I realize that I have typo. So I just want to make that point. No, that's that's grand. My apologies. I didn't realize you had that uh, uh, difficulty. Uh, members, the proposal as amended twice is in front of you. Councillor Donnelly, are you content with the proposal as now stands also? Councillor Gallagher is your seconder. Yeah, I'm, I'm content with it, sir. Members, is there anyone wishing to vote against the proposal as per on the screen? Any member of committee? I don't hear anything. Therefore, I declare the amendment carried, which is now the substantive motion. Can that be transferred to black, please, as the full substantive motion. Sorry about all of this, our, our visitors, but it's the protocol that has to be gone through. Uh, right, we now have the substantive motion. I don't see anyone wishing to amend any further. Again, I ask the question. I, I haven't heard anybody speaking against the substantive motion. And there's nothing in the chat box. Members, I declare the substantive motion passed. Um, I think we can conclude the debate at that stage. Uh, can I sincerely thank uh, Sheena, Stephen, Clark? Sorry, Chair. Do we, Sorry. Yes, sir. I was asked a number of direct questions. Uh, Dean, I haven't I'd had a chance to, to come back well. on yet. I mean, there's a number uh, of outstanding issues thank, there which have to be addressed. Thank, thank you, uh, Stephen. Quick direct questions that you need to answer. Thank you. That's great. Thank, thanks, Chair. Thanks for very much for letting letting me back in. I think a um, couple of things in relation to uh, uh, Councillor Duffy's uh, points. First of all, this I, I, look, I don't accept these arguments about saying that we're in a zero sum game about health versus housing. You know, it's it, exactly it's a very clear uh, kind of uh, argument strategy to try and pose it this way as saying there's nothing else we can do. Right. As if 
you know, it's not realistic to try and actually campaign around uh, and uh, uh, other alternatives. It's kind of, it's a defeatist position, basically. It's saying we've given up already, you know, that we're not going to try to, uh, first of all, we're, the, we're going to make political choices. That, and I gave a very clear one within the housing budget, the, pro, the preference to private developers over actually public housing. There are political choices that are being made now but I think that you know the the the, um, the minister and and her party need to actually uh, need to actually stand up to, and there are precedents that have been happened in the past where the, the minister and her party actually have stood up for things like derogations over universal credit for the for uh, the the non introduction of water charges, for example. Right to give up now on something so fundamentally important in terms of people's uh, a roof over people's head and the one concrete lasting legacy of the civil rights movement from six years. You know, we're hearing a lot of, we're hearing a lot about human rights and the right to housing. This is the housing executive is that legacy. And to give up on that and say there's nothing we can do about it, we'll just have to go along with what Mr. Westminster says. I, I you know, I, I, I don't uh, don't uh, accept that. Um, two two other very quick points. I, I, no doubt, uh, over the coming months, uh, myself and uh, Professor Roberts and uh, Clark Bailey will be in other fora where we will be discussing these uh, uh, the way forward. I would say one thing, though, and I have huge respect for uh, Professor Roberts uh, and the uh, and what he was able to do at Biker. We're talking about one housing estate as opposed to eighty-five thousand homes. There is no in these islands. We have no experience of running a mutual or housing co-op on that kind of level. The next biggest one in England is the Rochdale one, at about twelve thousand homes. Right? There are to be able to say that we can, you know, gross up from a housing estate or even from twelve thousand to uh, uh, to the size of the housing executive, right? Without a whole range of issues and problems coming up, I, I think is I I think that's unrealistic. I wait to engage with the debate and to hear what others what have to say on this. And the last one here, uh, uh, um, Councillor Duffy's quite right. There are a whole load of assumptions because there was a whole load of gaps actually in the minister's statement. Uh, and we don't know what's happening. And indeed the questions that have been answered, the written questions that have been answered, almost all of them finished with saying, I have instructed my uh, officials to, co to go away and work this up and we'll come back with some proposals by the end of the mandate. Right, which is uh, May 22. So we'll wait and see what happens. But on the central issue about privatisation, I think it doesn't do anybody any good by saying this is not privatisation. As if in some way, having the government accounting rules for a start say, this is now going to be privatisation. It is moving, that's what reclassification means, moving from being in the public sector to being in the private sector, according to the Office for National Statistics. Right. Um, it, it also um, it, it also as well means that I would see privatization as a process rather than a single event. We're not we're not looking at pri privatizations like the big nationalized uh, nationalized industries and and the utilities in the eighties and nineties. Privatization in the twenty first century is far more subtle. It's about changing these little labels so as private finance capital can get access to these public assets and that's going to be the crux of it because the borrowing that the, a privatized or reclassified housing executive is going to do is going to be in the capital markets it's going to probably going to be looking towards issuing uh corporate bonds and listing on the London stock exchange to trade those corporate bonds this is what is happening to the equivalent size housing associations that are based in London and the southeast this is what they are actually doing so Stephen have you any more so questions they, that they answered? So, that, uh, so sure. I, I think we're not talking about privatisation in terms of then a, uh, the housing uh, executive becoming a profit distributing kind of organisation, but it is going to be an organisation that's in the private sector, that's going to rely upon private finance, that's going to have shareholders like the Biker Community Trust. Uh, and and as well, remember, at one point we had mutuals in the finance industry that were called building societies. We know what happened to them. There are, once you let go of a public sector organisation, and it certainly will not be in the Stuart, public sector. Anymore. 
we we know what can happen. We have the example of the building society. You're, you're straying from actually answering the question that you know. That it, it was about privatization. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, so that, that, but uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, all, all the councillors, for, uh, for you, listening sir. to. And, you know, I, I'm not allowing the councillors in, but I will uh, read into the record the comments that are in the chat box. Uh, Councillor Harkin is concerned and wants it on record that he considers uh, that there has been an undermining of the deputation and the council's original motion. Uh, so that is now read into the record, Councillor Harkin. And Councillor Duffy hopes Stuart, that are submitting your uh, solutions to the minister. Uh, the minister is prioritizing housing while protecting health, and without the data, is making assumptions can be frightening. Uh, members, I am concluding uh, the debate on the two presentations and further comments that have been made. There will be further debate of, uh, offered and presentations coming. And you know, if Stuart and Gina wish to sit in and take note of the debates. They are held in public, uh, as you well know. So can I thank all who have contributed to what is a very complicated scenario going forward. And I hope that our debate in Council can in some way uh, enable a, a correct enactment uh, that will enable social housing to be there with the people in our district and Northern Ireland who actually need it, and that can be done in a way uh, that is satisfactory to all. It's very difficult to achieve. But thank you all for attending. Can I ask and a question, uh, Sorry, the debate is now closed. Thank you. Okay. I'm sure, moving on yeah. to the next presentation. This been a, procedurally, this has been grotesque. Uh, well, you can explain that via the standing orders, Councillor McCann. Uh, again, I'm not sure if you're on the committee, but your comments will no your comments will no doubt be noted, and as they are noted, you can bring that matter up at full council. Thank you, Councillor oh, McCann. I will, I will, I will. I'm sure you will. Thank you, Councillor McCann, and thank you and safe. Well, I was going to say safe journey, but most people are working from home. Thank you very much. Can we move on to the next presentation, please? And again, if I can get my iPad up and operating. Uh, Professor Paul Bartholomew, thank you very much for waiting. Uh, we have had very good news from uh, Ulster University, still called the University of Ulster, but we still uh, we have had great news today, which I am sure uh, you will bathe in the glory of uh, whilst you whilst you talk to us. But we also very much welcome what has come our way, and we look very much forward to hearing your presentation. Uh, Professor Paul Bartholomew, thank you. Thanks very much, and thanks for the opportunity to come and talk to the uh, council. I have a reasonably um, short presentation. I say short, it might take me 20 minutes to, to, to get through. You have to bear with me, I'll bring the slides up on the screen. It's probably the first time I've done this within the uh, WebEx uh, environment, but it looks as if it's going to be. Uh, straightforward. So I am sharing that now. Yep, that's it. That's up now. So that's full screen. So you can see that full screen. I hope. Yeah. Okay. I'll uh, work through this then. So I, I was invited to uh, this meeting broadly because I'm a, a new new vice chancellor to Ulster University, although not new to university, as I'll uh, as I'll say as I go through. And so this is my opportunity, really, my first opportunity to come and talk to the council. I'm really grateful for that um, for that opportunity. So my um, background is um, Ulster University is my third university. I joined as the Pro Vice Chancellor of Education in November 2016. Uh, so I've been here just over uh, four years now. I then became Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, Academic in uh, September 2019. Now the difference between those two roles broadly as PBC Education, I have responsibility for the, the learning and teaching environment, the quality of the awards, uh, academic staff development, uh, those sorts of things. And then when that kind of got upgraded to DVC um, academic, I then took on uh, line management responsibility for the executive deans of the faculty. And I began to have uh, involvement in the academic planning cycle, which is around such things as, as student student numbers. 
I then became the interim vice chancellor following the departure of the previous vice chancellor in uh, March 2020 and uh, was then appointed a substantive vice chancellor in August of, of 2020. Prior to my uh, full-time positions in higher education um, in 2001, that's when I was first appointed to my first HE full-time appointment. I had done some part-time work at the University of Derby prior to then, but then I was uh, recruited full-time into Birmingham City University. But prior to that, I was a senior radiographer within the um, National Health Service. And um, yeah, that's what I've been, that was what I was doing before. And it, it, it overlaps somewhat into some of the things that we'll be talking about today, uh, I guess. So in terms of my uh, appointment uh, context, um, you know, I'm March, the beginning of March 2020 and uh, less than three weeks into that appointment and I was closing our campuses. So that was an interesting perspective. As far as Ulster University goes on, um, goes, we did manage to pivot all of our business online. It's certainly been a challenge, but one that was uh, well met, uh, I feel. And I, I, I think we're proud at Ulster University of the degree to which we've given clarity to both students and staff around uh, how we're going to teach and research during the, the pandemic. And that clarity, I think, has stood us in really good stead through that, that, that planning uh, period. It gave staff uh, the ability to know what they had to teach and gave students the ability to know what it was that um, they, they were to expect. So I think we did a good job around uh, managing expectations. But I have to say, and like all of you who have been involved in other uh, in, in institutions, it's been the day-to-day has been pretty all-encompassing uh, and it's certainly not been business as usual i've tried not to let that get in the way of you know doing some strategic things and, and thinking about, about strategy and indeed we have done uh, quite quite a, a lot of that uh, but nonetheless the day-to-day as you can imagine during these the, these times takes quite a lot of uh, bandwidth However, because of that uh, appointment process in August, you won't be surprised to know that as one of those kind of interview questions, I was asked to share a vision for you here at the point of appointment. <clears throat> and broadly, I gave a, a commitment from me, and it was a recommitment on behalf of the university, I suppose, for better sub-regional balance and uh, recommitment to our multi-campus model. And we remain committed to those uh, three campuses. But I also really majored at that interview on um, trying to ensure that we could create enough what I called um, political and financial headroom to serve the best, best interests of the region we serve. And some aspects of my presentation this afternoon will cover uh, those things, and I think they, they overlap with, with your interests uh, too. I want to now just talk about uh, where we are in student numbers at McGee. I know that's something that members here will feel um, passionate about, as, as do I. As of this year, the one that we just started, we've got um, 4,498 uh, students. That's up some 261 on uh, last year. In fact, some, some stakeholders who I've worked with, I was reporting that I, I thought we weren't quite as, as high as that uh, this year. But those numbers in terms of who comes to the university are really quite dynamic and, and, and we get a building picture of how many students we've got as we go through the year. But that's the most up-to-date information that I received uh, as of um, uh, today. If we look back a bit more longitudinally, I think there is a sense in some ways that there's been some, some flight from Belfast before, but I, I want to look at the net numbers. Uh, sorry for Bel flight from Belfast, fl flight from uh, McGee, but I want to look at, at uh, those uh, numbers. It, we are actually up uh, 85 on five years ago. And if we look at the longer term compared to say a 2008, 2009, uh, to look at that long-term growth, we're actually up 930 over that longer term. What's really striking to me here, if we look at the overall numbers for Ulster University at all campuses, the university itself as a whole has only grown 1,004, yet the numbers by that reference period at, 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 at McGee are up 930. And that's, I think, um, significant. And some people might find that um, surprising. We have, of course, got very successful and active nursing uh, clinical competency uh, centre this year on, on uh, uh, Derry. Um, it's been running for a couple of years now. Uh, we still are taking students in there face to face and this year we're expecting some 5,000 students, not included within that number at the top, who come into that um, clinical competency centre. Now, although they're only here for a relatively uh, short time, they do stay uh, over overnight, one or two nights, and I think it contributes significantly to the number of hotel rooms. They, they can stay because they're classified as key workers and they are uh, uh, training to, to, to uh, be able to support um, the healthcare systems. Just um, 
keeping on that optimistic note, in terms of the next academic year, you'll know that we've been working really hard over the last few years to establish uh, a new medical school in the Northwest. We feel that that will be a significant contribution to Ulster University as a whole, and particularly to the McGee uh, campus. Um, we will be looking to recruit uh, 70 uh, medical students, and that's on, on, on top of those numbers that we've put there. And we've also secured a contract for uh, 40 paramedic uh, practice. And indeed, there's a there's a, a, a ministerial intention to continue for a commitment to grow nursing numbers. And as a consequence of that, although it's not finalised, we expect some additional uh, potential growth in nursing. <clears throat> I'm also uh, looking for additional growth in other existing subjects. And uh, in recent weeks, I've worked with executive deans to to see um, where we can do this. Uh, and 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 there's a there is a big question to ask here about you know why not. Why have you not done some of this stuff before? But something has uh, changed, and, I, and I'll get to that. But broadly, in terms of additional growth in other subject areas, where there is demand at McGee for those um, subjects, we, we will e e expand, and uh, we're committed to, to doing so. We believe we have an outstanding proposition for students. Um, McGee Campus for Ulster University routinely is uh, our best performing campus by uh, student satisfaction uh, measures and in most years is um, the most high performing um, campus uh, in, on, in, in Northern Ireland. And we're really um, proud of that. But we still need your help in getting that message out, I think. Um, you know, I think sometimes in terms of some of the uh, rhetoric that we have around the McGee campus and, and so forth, I, I think there's a sense from potential students about, you know, what is the the future of Ulster University in, in Derry. And I'm, I, I'm here today to give that commitment. And I hope I can ask for your support in relation to that. I, I, I think, you know, what we want all of us is for students uh, to come to that, that, that campus. Uh, and I think getting that support and getting that message out about what an outstanding proposition and viable proposition we have will be really important in continuing on that trajectory. So that's in the next academic year in, in um, 2021. And as we move forward with the news um, chair that you referred to um, earlier, um, in the 2022 academic year, we will see an additional about 850 health science students based on current numbers uh, coming onto the campus. There, of course, will be into the second year of the medical school with another 70 students, another 40 from the second year uh, intake from paramedic practice. And again, we'll see that pattern repeating for the four years of the medical um, degree and, and for the three years of paramedic uh, practice. And we'll have uh, additional potential growth in that nursing that there is, I, I, I believe, um, plans to be able to kind of expand year on year for about the next three years if governmental plans for expansion of nursing uh, were to play out. And that notion of still looking for additional growth in other, other subjects where there is demand, uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll continue with that commitment. Now you'll see on that slide in, in, in the top right, if I just go back uh, one, with next academic year, from, from, from where we are, are now, those add in to give us about 4,800 students. By the time we get to that 22-23 academic year, we've got a running total of 6,000 uh, students, which is significantly more than, than now. But it is my aim this afternoon to be fully transparent with, with, with members about how the system in HE uh, works and, and, and to share uh, that with you and to uh, take any questions that you might have. So I'm saying that I think 6,000 students is broadly achievable, but going beyond 6,000 requires a different operating environment, and that has governmental and um, political um, parameters to it, as I'll explain in terms of why. So that why really relates to the maximum student number cap. Um, of course, students in Northern Ireland don't pay a full contribution to, to fees. The Department of the Economy supplements that with block grant funding to the university, and the amount of the block grant funding is largely fixed. I've put in there and may even diminish. I, I think none of us will be surprised going forwards that there, there'll be a squeeze on public finances. And of course, our block grant is a public, uh, publicly financed entity that may well be squeezed uh, it, it itself. And that gives us some fragility in our, in our funding lines. But the fact that there is a block grant limits the number of NI students who can be accommodated in NI higher education but it doesn't limit those who can go and study in other jurisdictions. And indeed, there are about four to 5,000 students every year who will find their way over the water into GB universities. And we know that about two thirds of those tend not to come back. And that's 
I think, tremendously undermining of um, strategic plans that we might have to grow productivity and, and so forth. And, and a loss of young people, I think, is something that Gary uh, knows, knows a lot about. Um, so this system does indeed limit the growth of NI students in NI higher education. Um, Republic of Ireland students uh, benefit from the same subsidised system if they come into Northern Ireland, and as such, they're counted within the, the, the number cap. I'll talk to you in a bit about how, how buoyant I think uh, we, we've, the recruitment into the Republic of Ireland has been, but, but they still count within the capped numbers, and broadly, we will hit that cap um, pretty shortly as we go, go forward in the next um, year or so. So in terms of the maximum student cap, it's easy to think, and this is where I really need your, your, your forbearance and support, it's really easy to think that, well, we should just lift the cap. And if we lift the clap, cap, um, everything will be okay. But lifting the cap would require either more block grant to fund more students, or for the student contribution to be higher. Um, as we go forwards, we will know that, you know, there are uh, governmental elections next year, and although not directly within your purview, I know you to be uh, in influential people. I, I would like to think that this national debate in terms of how higher education funding is, um, or how high, higher education is funded, can indeed be one that gives us a solution that allows us to, to grow where we need to grow. What I think would be a real tragedy is if I think that that debate is curtailed by politicians through their manifestos painting themselves into a corner whereby they can't have the conversation because they've um, promised, for example, um, no increase in fees. Um, now, that fees debate is one that would definitely need to be done, but I would much rather that there were commitments to say um, that we would look at the overall funding model and come to one that's right for students, right for parents, right for industry, and right for, for, for universities without necessarily um, painting anybody into any uh, corners. Now, I did say before that things have changed and, and why are we in a position to start looking at growth per se? And that's because when we're now at the nadir of, of school leaver numbers, it's been going down for a number of years and we've hit the low point and the number gets higher now for each year for the rest of the decade. And that gives us an opportunity to grow subject to doing something about this maximum uh, student number cap. But without a change to the system, Northern Ireland won't be able to afford more students uh, in, in Northern Irish in universities. And the percentage of Northern Ireland students going to Northern Ireland institutions will decrease. Inevitably, I think those students who still want to get a degree will progressively um, go south of the border or they'll go over the water uh, for, for that. So given that they're likely to go elsewhere and potentially not return, we know two thirds who go the water do not, NI's access to graduates will do, diminish as a share of potential graduates. And I, I'm worried about that strategically for Northern Ireland actually going forwards. But, but lifting the cap just on its own is a bit, is a bit risky. And uh, again, we need to have a really good debate in relation to this. A follow student choice model would inevitably skew numbers towards Belfast. We know that would happen because it happened just this year. Um, members here will be uh, aware that there are two lots of A-level results last year. The first set that universities get, uh, uh, it, it, the first set that came through that were done by the algorithms but were the ones that were given to universities in advance. And all the planning and the admissions were, were made on, on those data. And accordingly, um, places were, were, were offered. And then there was a change and a lot, a lot of students get, got higher grades than uh, they had got, if you like, first time round in that. And as a consequence, we saw considerably uh, greater numbers of students going to higher education. But that increase was absolutely skewed towards um, Belfast. It meant that um, Ulster University actually cannibalised some of its own students. So we tactically had tried to um, build the north and northwest um, proposition away from um, Belfast by giving unconditional offers to those students who had um, our non non Julestown and Belfast campus as their insurance offers. Um, but then when they got upgraded with their, their grades, we found that um, they, they met their offers. Um, for those other programmes, and indeed we were legally obliged to honour them. That same phenomenon happened between Ulster students, and we lost some to Queen's, and we would have lost some uh, over the water. 
That's not to say that we didn't gain some from uh, EFI for exactly the same reasons uh, we did, but nonetheless, the skewing of just following student choice towards Belfast is something that, that worries me. So if Mazen is to be lifted to help us to be able to grow where we'd like to, it does need to be done with respect to um, the sub-regional need. Uh, and I think there are creative ways of, of, of doing that, but it does require, I think, a, a careful debate and not just a call for release the Mazen cap now, there will be unexpected uh, consequences of that, which mean that we will lose um, control of being able to um, target uh, growth. However, there is a real opportunity, and I said I wanted to talk to you about our, our buoyant uh, recruitment into the Republic of Ireland, for example. Over the last few years, we, we've made a proactive attempt because of um, uh, our Northwest proposition largely that um, to get more students from the Republic of Ireland, and that's really paying off. We've invested into that area. If you look at the number of applications we were getting in 18, 19, it's 275, and then year on year it increases to 340, 1,296, and uh, in, 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 in the most recent cycle, 1,902. I think remarkable in that is of those 1,902, 962 are from Donegal, and um, 711 of those are for McGee courses. So I think that's really a, a really positive number. Uh, many of those are for those health courses, some of which you know are moving here, here, here um, and they're also capped. So the capping works on a, on a number of programmes. And of course, we won't be the only interest uh, university that they're interested in. So the fact that we've got those numbers of interest at this stage won't necessarily uh, transfer. Statistically, you would expect on those sorts of numbers probably to, to convert about 20% of those who would actually eventually come in. That's not an unusual number. That's just the way in which if you think about the number of choices that students get for universities that they can, they, they can do, they would be the sorts of numbers that would that would play out. But there is a real opportunity there on, on top of the, the, the numbers uh, that, that we would be um, bringing in from um, Northern Ireland. Now, in terms of the potential numbers that we could have in Northern Ireland, if, if the cap allowed and we were decapped, it doesn't mean that the, the growth gets up to a point at which, you know, the, 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 the sky is the limit. There are still only as many students who were born 18 years ago to use that, that demographic. And if you look at that kind of blue line as we go through the years, it starts down at 2020 and goes to 2029. You'll see that we start to get a demographic um, uplift. Interestingly, though, for university provision, it flatlines a bit for the first couple of years. And that's because because we've been on the downswing of student numbers and we've got three and four year programs, we've still got bigger numbers of students rolling off because they represent the intake from uh, three or four years ago than the ones that we've got coming on. But that phenomenon smooths itself out by the time we get to about 2024 and we see the, that, that sustained growth within um, all those years. Now, I've I crunched these numbers independent of my colleague, Professor Brian Murphy, doing these in, 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 before this meeting today. And we both got to a pretty similar number. If, if we look at the sorts of projections that we might e e expect of where students would, would want to go, uh, it, it comes out to about, we, we could manage to get back to about 7,000 students if the cap allowed. I need to go back to the other slide, at least in our heads for the moment, and say the cap doesn't allow for 7,000 students. The cap will only allow us for 6,000 students. To get to 7,000, we need to raise the cap and raise the cap in, in, in such a way that doesn't just see the, a, 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 some skewing of that additional demand into um, uh, Belfast. That modelling that I've put here is with a 10% allocation for non-regulated provision, i.e. 10% of that would be postgraduate and, and, and international. And I think that's a number that we could, could grow, but it's not an atypical number for what we've been experiencing, the totality of Ulster. So this upper limit of, of, of 7,000 is a product of the growth in number of school leavers. Um, and, and it's limited by that. There are only so many hu extra human beings that are coming on on online and then we translated that that across knowing that there are other players in that that sector that, that those students will want to go to but we've tried to model out what an Ulster share might be subject to that cap um, going up so can we get to a higher figure than the than the 7,000 well we have a number of tactics really or a number of options that we might be able to 
that we might be able to deploy here. Um, first of all, you know, we can try and divert, divert those students from um, GP. I've said we have little actual control over that because we don't control where the student choice is. However, I think that there is a significant number of students in that, that four and a half to 5,000 who go over the water who are going because the cap is where it is and they don't have any opportunity to come over. And it's really unknowable at this stage what percentage of those, if they had additional opportunities in Northern Ireland, would choose to, to stay. If you were to really push me on that as a guess, I would say it's probably about a third. But I only say it as a gut instinct of someone who's been involved in higher education. I don't have any, any data to support that. But uh, I say little actual control, but I think that the raising of the cap would have some impact. We just don't know uh, what that would be, and it would still be within the student's gift. In relation to another thing, a bit more controversial for me, who's committed to campus balance is, you know, the McGee campus could gain a, a higher proportion of the UU growth than the ones that we've um, modelled in. There's some limited control in terms of what UU can, can, can do in, in relation to that, because students want to go and do subjects and some subjects are based on particular um, campuses. And as a cons consequence, you know, we can't move uh, everything. But I am I think because of the growth that we've got in the student numbers coming forward, I am warm to duplicating provision where such duplicated provision makes sense, i.e. enough students would want to do it to allow us to, to um, pay the staff um, to, um, to teach that, that course. So we've got some uh, limited control, but for very expensive courses that we would, you know, to, to move, uh, I still have responsibility to the university as the chief accounting officer um, to, to make things viable uh, and, and, and uh, we, can't, we can't move everything. And just as I'm committed to your campus, I'm also committed to our other campuses. There is the other one uh, to admit that we're in a market here and we could gain student share from other universities on, on the island. And again, it's, it's where the students want to be. But I do think that a number of things that we're doing um, in Derry, and I'll, I'll get onto that in a little bit, means that we've got a really persuasive, we've got a really persuasive offering. And it's that that I'd like us all to get to get behind, because that gives me real options for additional growth beyond that ceiling that I've, I've put in place uh, there. Um, but it does place us, because of the limited number of human beings, into competition with uh, other institutions. But that's OK. Uh, we're up for that. We could also grow the percentage of international and postgraduate students that we get. I say I've modelled in about 10%. About and I think we have some limited control. I've put that on the green because I think there's something that the, the city deals proposition, and, and one of them talk about that, uh, does give us a real opportunity, I think, to, to, to make that really attractive uh, once that comes on stream. So let me talk a little bit about the uh, city and growth deals opportunity. I just first of all say, you know, the city and growth deals isn't, isn't money for, for, for UU, it's for the project uh, for, for the city. And, and, and indeed, it, it, it costs us to participate. There's an expectation of 10% of, 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 of capital funds that we would contribute and we were committed to making those funds available. And um, we're actually be making those from sale of lands elsewhere on, on our estate. So it's important to understand that for us, city and growth deals doesn't directly deliver any monetary or student numbers benefits to UU on its own. However, what I think it does do is have a lot of indirect benefits and, and, and that's of great interest to I think everybody here and, and of course to me too. That City Deals opportunity is a great opportunity to bolster the vibrancy of, of the offering and the plans down on the waterfront and so forth. I, I think will fundamentally get us into that competitive uh, market to be able to, to, to grow beyond the, the people that we can uh, currently draw upon from our school leavers uh, within the jurisdiction. It's a great opportunity to build internationally significant centres of research, and that has the potential in and of itself to then drive recruitment probably because of the specialities that are in that city deal in the postgraduate space first, but I see and I'm, and I'm challenging the executive deans to think about how that might cascade to undergraduate numbers. Now, the undergraduate numbers is only even a target for us if that cap is some way managed. Otherwise, that postgraduate uh, market, which is uncapped, is an area that we will be um, concentrating on. And of course, the right thing to do would be if we had the opportunity to do both. As the city deals begin to deliver, of course, they're not there just for their, <clears throat> their own, um, their own rights. They're there to um, power industry growth. <coughs> and that in turn will grow skills, uh, a skills need 
within the area. And I think, um, you know, those companies who will be attracted because of um, the knowledge transfer activities that will uh, occur through uh, the city deals will want to populate their businesses with skilled people. And again, we would need to address the, the cap for UG growth, but it, it's important to know that the postgraduate growth is not so capped. And, and that's why we feel that there's potential to, to kind of get behind that um, first. So city deals really good opportunity to be able to push at that ceiling. So in summary, um, I just want to say, I, I think we have achieved significant growth with outstanding quality. That numbers in terms of, you know, some, some uh, 930 growth from in, in, in the longer term. That's by, while, while having, you know, um, the nursing school is the seventh best in the, in, in the United Kingdom, which is, which is brilliant. And we get as high as 91% of the national um, students survey. We're delivering a medical school, we're growing nursing, We've got the new paramedic practice program and we're bringing that complementary health sciences school uh, in. I think we can get to 10,000 students within the current Northern Ireland operating context. So it's nothing changes in relation to the cap and so forth. That natural direction of travel of, of, of you know, um, things that we've got on the go will lead us towards about 6,000 students. Beyond that, we hit that Mazen cap and it becomes a bit of a hard stop in the undergraduate provision. I believe that if we were able to lift that Mazen cap, and I would only want to do that with some of that sub-regional protection that you may have heard me talking about in other fora, we could deliver um, 7,000, perhaps a bit more students by 20, 2029. Then the city deals proposition laying on a subsequent growth should help us grow additional local demand for those, those skills and make the McGee proposition even more attractive for students. But going through that 7,000 requires us to go beyond the people who have been born 18 years ago, uh, and we need to begin to, to, to pull people from uh, other areas. So I'm looking forward to, to working with more people in Derry to continue the excellent progress that I think we're making. I'm committed, as I hope is, is clear here, to being transparent in terms of that debate and to help inform uh, the necessary sector change. And I think together we are and will continue to make a positive uh, difference uh, in this place. So I'd just like to thank you for your uh, uh, attention and I'll, I'll stop my sharing and we can take um, any questions. Thank you. Paul, thanks a million for a, a very enthralling presentation and of great interest to all of us who represent the electors throughout our district council area. At present, I have four councillors wishing to come in uh, Councillor Rory for uh, Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Paul, for, for the, the presentation. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say it's great news uh, that health science undergraduates are going to become the McGee uh, from next year onwards. Um, it's a welcome step uh, towards our interim goal of 10,000 students at, at the McGee campus, and I'm mindful of the fact there's been a flurry of announcements in the past year. We've had the medical school, we've had paramedic practice. Now we have health sciences and, and they're all extremely positive. But the 10,000 target remains unmet. Uh, the one plan envisaged 10,000 students by 2020. It's now 2021 and we don't have 10,000 students. Uh, new decade, new approach, which was published last January uh, said that the executive would bring forward proposals for the expansion of McGee to 10,000 students and there have been no proposals as yet. At a recent executive committee meeting it was revealed that an updated business case uh, was still to be received by the Department for the Economy. Um, so my question is where are we with the business case? Um, how are we going to get the 10,000 students at McGee? Which courses will the possibly 4,000 extra students uh, be doing. Um, what's the time scale for expansion and how is it all going to be financed and resourced? And I'm mindful that a lot of your focus in the presentation was about the Mazen cap and obviously that presents a massive difficulty and that's going to be a decision that needs to be made by the executive in consultation with university providers in the north. And I'm conscious that I think it was a few months ago that our corporate position in council is that there should be an increase in the Mazen cap. 
for exclusive use in Derry to allow expansion to happen. We wrote to Diane Dodds and her response was, I set the cap, it's up to the university providers to decide where they put those students. Um, so I don't want to detract from today's announcement, which was brilliant. Uh, the medical school is coming online. That's really positive. Paramedic science, really positive. The potential for more nursing places, again, extremely positive. And the raft of sort of study deal innovation projects. It's all excellent news. But when can we expect detail on wider expansion plans? Thank you. Uh, Paul, you want to come in on that? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to that. And um, broadly, I, I mean, let me, let me be frank ab about that. Yes, there's a number of, of, of 10,000 students. Some of you would have heard me on Radio Foil dodging the 10,000 students saying, actually, we need to have the, all, all those questions that you've asked there in terms of where are they coming from, we need to have answers to. I, I felt that I'd covered off on some of those answers there in where the potential was. The, the population that we have of Northern Ireland with the existing distribution of students has the potential to get us to 7,000. So where does any additional students come from? That they, they will inevitably come from other universities and they'll come from other universities either over the water. And I do believe that there is um, a, a, an extra demand um, that, that, that could be tapped if the Mazen cap uh, came up, but we mustn't double count. Uh, some of that will, um, you know, be perhaps folded into getting to the, to, to the 7,000, but we could be optimistic of going beyond uh, that number if we were able to um, control it. The postgraduate students that we might might come will, will contribute to that. But broadly, there isn't a way that I can just create more students. Um, there's a limit to how many courses we can move. Every single course um, line that we move costs us in terms of uh, capital to be able to do it, and we have finite resources. Every time we move a subject uh, line, and even if we get into the route where we've got protected additional Mazen for McGee, there are other changes that happen, have to happen in the funding model to protect the university from that. Currently, any shortfall on Mazen anywhere means that the university will take a hit in relation to its share of the block grant that it would get as it's shared out between uh, the universities. We would need to ensure that there is some ab ab ability to insulate this university from really deleterious financial impact. If there's any lag at all between an uplift in Mazen and us filling our Mazen. So I think that there's only room for 7,000 um, students in, in terms of the population uplift. Any further numbers will have to come from other universities. I would love to see the, the com that competition um, being put in place with those that are over the water, because I think four and a half to 5,000 students who go over there, two thirds of whom don't go back, does not do anybody in Northern Ireland any favours. That proportion, I think, is, is somewhat unknown. I speculated that I felt that that could be as much as 1,500 students staying in Northern Ireland. I would anticipate in terms of um, those, if there, if there wasn't the hypothecated Mazen that you suggest, that we would see that we would get probably somewhere between 40 and 50% of, of those numbers when you factor in the other, the other players in Northern Ireland. But of course, you're right. If the Mazen can be hypothecated in, in some way, then uh, there's a route to be able to um, divert those to a single place. And when I say there needs to be sub-regional protections, I do think it's incumbent uh, upon us having a, a wider debate around the, the whole system. That whole system isn't just ourselves and Queens. We've got a, a whole lot of provision of HE and FE. We've got neighbours in Northwest Regional College. We have to think about the skills that's required for Northern Ireland. We have to think about the levels that those skills are, are, are at. There are foundation degrees and all sorts of other propositions that are out there. And it will require some degree of planning. Ulster University, stroke me, doesn't have all the answers uh, to that. And if I'm going to be um, bold, to that, I, I haven't, um, I, I, I haven't, um, I've been the person, I suppose, in the public domain who has had some degree of reticence in saying 10,000 students. 
Instead, what I've wanted to do is sit down, look at the numbers, and try to give a transparent um, assessment of where I think the numbers can be found um, right now. Previously, we have had people say 10,000 students, but just saying it doesn't make it happen. What I've tried to do is to be completely honest with everybody here and others and say, I'm going to sit down and work out where I can get these students from. And that's the number that I get to looking at the demographic picture. There is higher potential within there, but it means that we go into competition with other universities. And I think that's where the, the proposition of Ulster University in Derry is something that we really need to go out there and, and, and sell. But getting to 7,000 students and having a coherent, really don't need to do anything different plan to get to 6,000, I think is a significant step towards that. Um, and, and we'll continue. Uh, it may not be the whole answer that you, you would want, but I'm just trying to be as honest and transparent about the realities as I see. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, moving to Councillor Cooper. Hi, the new chair, and thanks to Paul. Paul, obviously, I've met with yourself and all our senior staff um, several times over the last uh, year, uh, both on the medical school and on, on the wider expansion. So a lot of what you've presented, obviously, I've heard before, but um, it's, it's still useful, I think, for everybody in this committee um, to get, get the real detail, because I think, you know, the, the 10,000 figure, as you've said, has been bandied about. Um, we're still of the view the 10,000 figure has to be met, but it's a, the, de the devil in the detail about how we achieve that. And I think the key word you use that was proposition. Uh, around what the proposal is of, of what, what we're presenting to potential students uh, that would want to come and study here. Um, I mean, all the progress we've made the last year around medical school, around the allied health, you know, um, the, the medical school uh, process was torturous as far as we were concerned, as far as Sinn Féin was concerned, what we got there. And it was done through collaboration with yourselves. And now with the allied health announcement, compared to where we were a year, year and a half ago, we, we are on a, a far better trajectory but it is still a starting point. And it brings me back onto the business case uh, because it's specifically in terms of the Mazen, uh, there's a direct correlation as far as we're concerned because that business case being submitted, you know, not as soon as possible, being done with, with good uh, thought and detail, uh, which I know will be the approach, but in terms of linking it to the Mazen, but also specifically the idea of sub-regional ring fence and whatever word you want to use around uh, student places, they make sure that McGee gets the focus that it requires, and that's the approach we've taken, not just around the university, but with, with Invest NI and, and so many other uh, bodies. That there has to be a specific approach to dairy, and, and New Decade, New Approach is very explicit on that and very clear on that, and that's why we think if a bud was going on to a minister for additional mass and places, it has to be framed in that perspective. Um, also framed on the idea that the right courses will be uh, offered, it's not a, and, and again, moving courses from existing Removing existing courses from other campuses is not it's not the way forward. It's in some cases it may be, but we need to be more original about what McGee can offer that others aren't offering. And again, we focus a lot on the medical in the last year for obvious reasons. But again, business, engineering, and dare I say it, even humanities, which has gone out the out the door in, in a lot of cases. Um, you know, there's still I think a demand there that we could be uh, uh, trying to, to service in terms of getting people back to McGee. Who have gone all elsewhere to study history, politics, and all of those. Um, so you know, there's a there's a job of work for a minister to do. There's a job of work for the university to do. Student satisfaction we know is very high, but you know, it's, the university in general is still talked down amongst the dairy residents. The gear is still talked down in terms of being an option, even though it's a lot cheaper than travelling across the water. So that that idea of of us setting a positive, not a positive spin, but being very very clear to potential students that that it is somewhere that you should go and study. And I say that having spent six years with this when most of my fellow students went across the water. I have a, <clears throat> a few thousand pounds of student debt. They've got thousands and thousands and thousands. Uh, you know, so even financially, there's a there's a sale there which um which we have, but it should also be about the course offer. Now the thing around the Mazen and a business case the current minister, and I'll be very clear in saying it, as far as we're concerned, Diane Dawes is not interested in uh in ring fencing for McGee, but obviously we're conscious that we are in the final year almost now of the mandate, the current mandate. And I'm not saying if it's even a Sinn Féin minister, but if a minister from another party were uh, in the DFE role after the next mandate, I would be hopeful they take a much more progressive approach to ring fencing, mass and places, uh, and adding to that. On top of that, the, uh, the students from across the border, you know, there is obviously capital money potentially uh, possibly available through Dublin in terms of their shared 
future funding and all of that. Um, we obviously are still lobbying for student places to be uh, funded in some shape or form. That's a, a long running debate, but it still has to be done. But it's encouraging that we have a, an uplift again of students from Donegal in particular. And it, it highlights the fact that McGee has to be a Northwest campus, not just a dairy campus. It has to serve as the whole Northwest area. So that obviously is good news that there's an increased demand. The postgrad in particular, because again, no mass is needed, as you said, and the income generation from that, which is why you know, myself and others argued when the Allied Health consultation was taking place, we wanted postgrad and undergrad. And a lot of that was to do with income generation as well uh, and keeping people here to work as opposed to just staying here on an undergrad basis. So the more we can do around that, the better around attracting more postgraduate places. Um, there's a lot of activity needed on that. That's not a, a, an easy fix, but it's something that, that's there. And the more the reputation grows of McGee at undergrad, undergrad level, the more chance we have of keeping people here at postgrad level as well. The study deal element of that, you know, in terms of that reputational thing, you said it doesn't bring extra student numbers automatically, which is true, but the reputational um, element of that, if we're seen to be delivering uh, very innovative projects around engineering, uh, advanced uh, medicine, all of that, that in itself as a, as a marketing tool is, is invaluable. And in terms of then getting people to come here for study deal as undergrads and then stay as postgrads, I think it's a much easier sell. Again, all of that combined will we'll add, and I've, I've already used this term before when we talked about this in uh, debates in the past, it's building blocks. It isn't going to happen overnight. When, when we get to that 7,000 figure you mentioned, Hopefully, relatively soon in comparison to the, the lack of um, substantial growth we've had over the last four years. Um, but you know, getting that final, filling that final 3,000 gap is not going to be straightforward. Uh, I'm very well aware of it. But I would hope that in two or three years' time, we're in a position where trying to fill that gap is much easier because of the reputational change that's taken place around McGee. And that means everybody in this city, councillors included, has to be positive. I know there's been historically, in terms of Ulster, for very, very good reason. Uh, suspicion, um, a lack of uh, willingness to basically promote McGee because Ulster was running it. they will be very blunt on that and, and very good reason for that. The fact that there's more clarity coming from yourself and I much prefer clarity than getting a, getting a bit of fluff, a bit of spin because you can see through it very, very quickly and previous incumbents, shall we say, came in the chamber here and, and made promises and didn't keep them because they couldn't keep them. Um, whereas I, I, I'm I'm actually grateful that you're, you're it's a refreshing change that you are being more honest. But again, that 10,000 figure, it still should remain. In terms of the size of this city and the wider Northwest region, it should remain uh, the ambition of, of both the university, of the council, and of the executive as well. Um, and overall, you know, if we combine and collaborate, we'll get there. Um, but as I said, it's a good starting point, what we heard today, what we've heard the last six months. Uh, and hopefully we can work together now to see uh, further change taking place. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Cooper. I'm not sure if there's a question in there, Paul. Do you wish to come back on it? I just say say thank you, and I think it was a comprehensive, um, you know, exploration of of, of where we are, and, and just in lines of, of you know, I, I thank you for thanking me for the transparency. It's quite important that I am transparent. I, I think that's important to me personally that I do that. And in in light of that, you said you know to the seven thousand. I have to go back to say without a change to the system, that number is six thousand. The seven thousand is if if we were able to address. Uh, the Mazen cap, but but you're right. There is more that we can do, and that 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 whole piece about wanting to talk talk at the McGee campus up as opposed to down is absolutely. I, I I think it must be a better position for all of us to talk it up rather than down when we know that we would like people to, uh, to go there. So so thanks for for, for recognising that as well. And I understand that that you know in in the past people would have wanted about that commitment and and to perhaps speak speak for my um, predecessors, they were doing what they were doing within the context of um, falling student numbers, i.e. school leavers. For the first time in a long time, we're now on the upward tra trajectory. And, and in some ways, I suppose I've got a bit of an easier job than they had, because at least I'm facing um, you know, an upward trend in student numbers as opposed to a downward trend. Which is the one that they had, which which gave them an extra difficult task to 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 deliver. But thanks for your comments. Uh, thank you, Paul. Moving on to Alderman McClintock. Thank you, and thank you, Paul, for that very detailed uh, presentation. Uh, it was very very useful, and I think transparency, as other people have said, it has been very refreshing. The transparency um, that you have brought to the discussion there today. 
um, very much welcome your commitment to the sub-regional balance and the multi-campus approach. I think that's very, very um, worthwhile hearing that. And also the fact that you're talking about additional growth in other um, areas, uh, not just stealing people away from other universities within Northern Ireland, but looking as well across the water to those who maybe who could be attracted to study at home. Uh, I think today's news has been such a fantastic boost, not just for McGee, but for the whole city and district as well. I mean, it's great to get medical, uh, to get such positive news between the medical school, the nursing, the allied um, ser health services, the paramedics. It's really been quite positive news for us. And I think the whole uh, the city deal and the McGee expansion are obviously very complementary and in some ways dependent on each other. Um, so I suppose we're hopeful that the momentum that has started now um, will continue. And I suppose in some ways you've sort of said yourself the right, the right man in the right place at the right time. And uh, hopefully that that momentum will continue um, for the city and uh, the region. And I suppose all of us here uh, are obsessed with the mass numbers and it was refreshing that you were so honest about the difficulties there because we have all had that 10,000 magic figure in our heads for so long and it is certainly a, an aspiration of all of us here and I think when I heard you say that you would hope to have 7,000 by the year 2029. My first thought was, goodness, that's absolutely not what I wanted to hear. But I think you've explained that very well, Paul, and I welcome that, the fact that you are being absolutely honest with us. And I think, as others have said, we still have that aspiration that we want to see see that grow. So I don't really have a question. Um, I thank you for your honesty, your transparency to us today, and hope that the good news um, will continue and that we can collectively work together in this council to overcome and to assist with any problems that might be um, still on the horizon for uh, McGee in the time to come. So thank you for, for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Hilary. Uh, there were no questions there, so I'll move straight on to Paul. Councillor Gallagher. Thank you, Trevor Emerson. Transparency is a great word here yeah, getting news today. Hi, and I'll make use of myself in a wee minute. Hi, um, Paul, I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware or not, but I uh, council, council recently given a, a submission to the consultation that was recently been undertaken. And I think that that was a fairly uh, lengthy submission. And uh, I, I, I would have liked to have seen some, some of your stuff in the presentation trying to address that submission and the council submitted and and because some of the stuff that was in that consultation was around what University of Ulster's ideas were uh, or lack of for for the city around for example like the post post grads being very much based in Belfast undergrads and and, and McGee if there was going to be there any race. Hi, and to see Paul when you talk about you know, the willingness to meet sub sub regional needs, and when you see some of the stuff that was in the consultation, for example, McGee not being a neutral space, that that gives rise to historical issues that the city has faced and discrimination and and the lack of. Um, Third level qualification that a get out of jail card for the unwillingness to invest in McGee is to just label it not a neutral space. And that allows for further and further and further and as 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 a as an excuse to not an invest in McGee. And we see this and we put it under the current context around you know, the city deals and a lot of million pounds being invested and the potential to be invested in there. there. There is a suspicion around, and I'm being transparent, I've said it before, and and there's a suspicion around just that the University of Ulster is talking very nicely, 
but reality has never delivered. And it's it's around being after the big prize of investment around sunny dates. And some of the stuff that we've heard previously, again around sub-regional needs, is, and I think you might have stated it yourself at one time, was when you talked earlier about capping and uh, student allocations, but that was stated as in coming back of when Belfast reaches its full capacity. So there needs to, there, there's nearly like, it's, whatever dairy gets, it's nearly contingent on Belfast needs getting met in an entirety before any investment comes. And I know I see you shaking your head there, but that's, and, and the round of being transparent, you, you've come back and tell me this, and I'll just have another question for you, just do you see around you know, the announcement and, and uh, the health, health science staff? I've, I've heard on the grapevine that on block, the staff are refusing to allocate, reallocate to Belfast or to Derry on a permanent basis, which for me, when I hear that is, I think there's a great risk these courses won't even be completed and they'll end up coming back to Belfast. So if, if we're going to invest these places, we need the staff and the resources come and wait to ensure that it's just not a year course and then they, they finish or get shifted. I'll, I'll come back against that and the last one and say there's absolutely no chance that it will return within a year or, or even longer. It's just too involved for us and too expensive uh, to do that. In terms of the staff, if, 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 if I may, I, I think you've been a bit unfair to the staff. We will have some staff who live in Newcastle who've got small children at school and with the best will in the world, it, it will be difficult for them to make a daily um, commute to Derry and back, or they're given a, a choice where they would have to move locale, they might have a partner to go somewhere. So they are still, you know, people with their own lives who, who will have to make a, a decision and we, and we understand that and we'll support them as, as, as best we can. I'm not particularly surprised that, you know, uh, it's been in Jordanstown for a long time, people who have lives that are there but in terms of our ability to run that course at McGee you know that we've got the we, the start isn't until 2022 so we've got um you know one and a half years to to prepare for that that transparency that we're both talking about means the staff now know where it's going to go they can make their decisions in terms of uh, what they want to do in that regard some people who have you know lives that are too difficult to upend and to move and couldn't accommodate that um, may well have to take some some decisions. Um, it it is part of the solution that we do have that postgraduate at, at Belfast because there are some of those uh, staff who you know might not have to come up to um, McGee every day. Some of the days they can go onto that Belfast provision and teach on the on the postgraduate um, side, and it gives us uh, the ability to have some some mitigation in that space. And in some ways, it's an enabler of us being able to move the undergraduate because it gives us uh, some solution to make it manageable for those staff who will have to, if you like, transect um, quite a, a wide area of um, geography. So uh, I, I, I do think that that's, that's the case and we wouldn't have moved it if we felt that we couldn't staff it appropriately. Uh, we haven't had any difficulty staffing the School of Nursing or the School of, of Medicine. And, and we think we won't have any uh, trouble uh, here either. In relation to the McGee will only fill when Belfast will fill, I think that's been picked up on a, on a statement that I said at, at, at some point, might have even been at the Public Accounts Committee. And it's, it's, it's not what I meant, but I, I can see how people um, are, are, are coming to that conclusion. It was on the, and you have to hear kind of the full quote. The full quote was at the, uh, uh, at the moment, We've got uh, the provision that we have in Jordanstown is moving to Belfast. We're not looking particularly to um, grow that, certainly in the, in, in the regulated space, we're not looking to uh, grow that. But because it's got 20% less floor space at Belfast than it's got in Jordanstown, even if we wanted to grow, we don't have the real estate. So I was just trying to make the point that as we get into this demographic um, upturn, uh, it isn't that the growth is dependent on Belfast, but the Belfast campus will be full 
as a consequence of Jordanstown coming across. And thus, Ulster University is strategically incentivized to look to its other campuses to uh, take whatever growth we can get. There were some people who I think also um, made some sense of said, when I said, you know, any growth, I didn't mean in terms of I didn't anticipate any. My slides today say that I think that there is some growth to be had uh, within the system. Indeed, what I was trying to suggest is that's growth that we likely would not be able to so readily accommodate at volume uh, in, in the Belfast campus. And we will have to um, look to our other campuses. And that underpins some of my appetite that I shared with you earlier for perhaps duplicating provision where we need to, just because that's where our real estate will be. Now, that's not to say that within the patterns of, you know, you get beyond nine to five and the sorts of hours that undergraduate students expect that in the evening provision and so forth, in the postgraduate space that we don't think there's growth to be had in that non-regulated space on the new Belfast campus uh, and that will be fruitful for us but when I say it's fruitful for us that's fruitful for Ulster University to enable it to underpin and finance its multi-campus proposition which absolutely includes this campus and in many ways the ability for us to monetize all of our campuses has a benefit for all of our campuses because we don't have any shareholders or anything we're, we're, we're all, all, all we're doing is trying to run those campuses in those three locations and, and we will sweat our assets, as they say, wherever we can get them. And for me, that's a matter of trying to balance it out. So I don't see it as any diminishment of the commitment here. And, and hopefully, you know, the track record of what we're doing at the moment uh, speaks for itself. I, I understand that they, people see our campuses in competition for each other. I don't, of course. I see them as necessarily complementary. But I do have to ensure that LC universities financially viable uh, across the piece. And that requires some and, and constant uh, juggling in that regard. So I hope there's some, some reassuring um, words that I have for you in there in terms of what some of those things uh, mean. I, I, I remain opt optimistic, but optimism in and of itself isn't enough. We, we need to actually really do, do the work and the recruitment. Only a second, just to see, see when you talked earlier about the university taking a hat versus having put in a spot to dairy and not filling it versus being able to be filled in Belfast. But that gives concern to us, do you know, because there's nearly an element of, of chicken and egg, of chicken and egg. And, and you, I'm really glad that you, I'm really glad that you raised that because it is chicken and egg. And what we need is to have that debate around the solution, which kind of um, makes them both eggs, if I can use that metaphor, I don't know how, well, how to put it. And, that, and, and, and you're right, and, and that's absolutely part and parcel of the debate. Yeah. But that wants me that we're the egg. Do, do you know what I mean? Well, I, 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 yes, and I'm not, I'm not going to deny that there aren't risks here. Things have to change within the model to grow the numbers. If they don't change, if we're asked to grow that numbers without those safeguards, what we will see if there's a lag between how the funding model works and the student numbers, where the, with the best will in the world, it might take some time to grow that. And if in that dip, it costs us millions of pounds to be able to sustain that, that's something that is clearly a disincentive. I don't need incentivizing to grow McGee. I am well motivated uh, to have that better campus balance. I'm well motivated to grow Ulster's business across all of its campuses. But I probably do need something to change to ensure that I'm not perversely disincentivized to do things through the financial model. That's that's the bit that you're right. There is some chicken in it. Well, to see you see around, you know, the the, the PR on it and, and people talked earlier about talking up and being positive. And to see see some of the stuff around like the findings that was in the consultation, it didn't it didn't allow space to up it in a positive manner. You know, it, it did look like day once again was getting short chains. Which, and if you look at the length of the submission that council submitted to yourselves, there was a lot of issues in there that need dealt with to enable everyone to lift the boat rather than try and sink it. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Uh, can I move on to Council Reddy? Uh, yes, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Vice Chancellor, for your presentation. Uh, I found it very useful, Paul, very informative, and I, I'm conscious that uh, my colleague, Councillor Farrell, spoke earlier in the de debate about the value that uh, today's announcement brings to the city and the wider region. I suppose the point I wanted to make, Chair, in relation to today's announcement is that it is then slightly disappointing to hear the Minister talk about what today's announcement for the McGee campus means for the Korean kit. 
campus because we haven't had uh, similar concerns from the minister when campuses in Belfast were getting investment at the lack of investment in our campus in our city. So I think it's it would be remiss of us not to pass comment on that and and, uh, and recognise the need that. Uh, that, that is, you yourself, Paul, have said that uh, investment in one campus doesn't necessarily mean that there's competition against another campus. I think that we need to look at the University of Ulster as a, a as a body that has campuses right across Ulster. If we look at this name, uh, today's announcement will mean an awful lot for people who live in Donegal, uh, who live in Fermanagh, who live in Tyrone, who want to go on to third level education, uh, but don't see themselves as wanting or wishing to travel to County Antrim for that. So we can't centralise all our university provision in Northern Ireland in County Antrim. We have to have an Ulster approach. And I think that that's why uh, today's announcement is so beneficial, not just for our city, uh, but the entire Northwest region. And when I say Northwest region, I mean Coleraine as well. They shouldn't be seen in competition with each other. We all need to be working together uh, to deliver the best for everyone who lives across uh, Northern Ireland. I, I think it would serve the Minister better to look at how she can bring bids to the executive to get the MASM cap lifted because in this chamber virtually today, but in the previous physical chamber in the Guildhall, we heard from our own council officers who did undertake a lot of work in relation to uh, supporting and helping the uh, University of Ulster with their proposals uh, for McGee for the medical school and so on. Uh, we, we heard from them that the, the block to growing the number of students is not anything to do with a competition between Derry, Coleraine or Belfast. It's uh, the, the block is the MASM cap. And that's what the executive ministers need to focus their minds on, uh, getting that removed. So uh, I, in conclusion, Chair, uh, I just want to thank Paul again for the presentation. But it would also be uh, worth noting, Chair, for the record, the fact that our council officers have done a huge amount of work to assist in relation to the not just the announcement that happened today in terms of responding to the bids and responding to the consultations, but in the legacy body, the old Derry City Council, uh, our council helped fund the business case for the medical school and it's off the back of that type of investment uh, by the ratepayer into third level education that we're seeing now the fruits of that uh, come out with other courses aligned to the medical school coming to our city and, and region. So I, I think today is a good, a good announcement and a good step in the right direction, but we obviously have a huge lot more work to do. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Paul, do you wish to come back on that? Um, no, I think that you know the matter for the minister is is, is one one for the minister. I, I I mean I'm I'm reasonably new to Northern Ireland, and I, I'll just make an observation in terms of um, you know one of the things that's really struck me is is how many people are are passionate and care about our institution and what goes on in it and there are there's lots of commentators but i have to say as i've said to many stakeholders in this i i, I would take that 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 passion over indifference um every day of the week so i thank everybody here for for, for, for their for their interest we, we know there are uh, other views um but uh, yeah, that's a matter for others uh thank you paul if i can just uh fill in on a, on a couple of uh issues that are touring about in my head shall we say um, you know what the university can offer, etc. And as you well know yourself, uh, the um, you cannot underestimate the ambience of an area when it comes to student attraction. And uh, Councillor Gallagher did mention the issue of neutral space and the issues that that presents. Uh, if I think on, on my own children, my my eldest boy went to Napier, my daughter's at uh, uh, John Moore's. Uh, and my younger son intends to go to Bangor in North Wales. Um, in fact, my daughter's cohort, one quarter of her cohort at John Moore's are from Northern Ireland. So it's right to point out those who choose to go uh, to third level education outside of Northern Ireland. Uh, and it's hard to avoid the perception, if not the actuality, uh, that for the PUL community, um, universities in Northern Ireland can at times be cold for them to attend. Uh, 
you, you mentioned there the activities, uh, pro proactive activity to bring students from the Republic of Ireland uh, to our Austria University. Is there a similar proactive approach taken? Uh, and again, I don't know what may be just the perception uh, of the uh, you know Protestant students not wanting to go to university in Northern Ireland. Is there a proactive approach taken to retaining uh, those students in Northern Ireland? Because as you rightly say, once they go, they're hard to get back. Thank you. Yes, I mean we 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 try to um, retain them, but in, in, in and you know there's there's two sorts of retention. There's the retention in terms of the inter-year retention, ensure that they complete their study, and and we would be better than our benchmarked institutions in relation to that. But university is about a life enriching experience that gives students um, choices, and in many ways it would be counter to the culture of the university to try to create an environment that would curtail students' choices, but. Some of the collateral stuff that we're doing and the bit I touched on, I think, through the city deals, for, for example, where, where our investment is in, in city deals, whereby there aren't a great deal of um, direct benefits from the monetary or the student side, but we're participating in a culture to, to grow business and grow jobs. And it's that participation that helps create work destinations for people after uh, they they graduate and that's really what's in it for Ulster University in terms of the city deal piece is that you know we're, we're doing that as part of team Northern Ireland really and I think that's where the retention of the of the graduates comes from we've got another role to play in, in, in attractive postgraduate courses for them to go into that but it doesn't help in the longer term what helps in the longer term is that there are uh, graduate positions for graduates and I think the city deals do do a lot in that space so yes there's work to do and Ulster University would do its bit, but it, it, it's not for Ulster University to attempt to curtail the life choices of its students. That would be counter to the philosophy of any um, university, I feel. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, Alderman Matik wants to make a very brief comment. Thank you, Chair. I really appreciate you letting me back in again. I suppose it's just for the record. I know that some of our local papers have uh, carried comments from the economy minister, but if I could just give the full context, it only runs to two sentences. Um, it, it actually says that the minister said, clearly this is a good day for McGee and another step forward for the university in the Northwest. I do, however, understand the concern that the announcement has prom prompted because many in Coleraine had been expecting these courses to go to their com campus and are now left disappointed. Just want to place that in records. Thank you, Chair. Members, th thank you uh, for your contributions. Paul, very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, and obviously, uh, as, a, as a council, uh, we wish the campus at McGee well. And uh, I would hope in the future that the student population in London Derry will grow via the work that is being done at, at McGee. So thank you very much indeed, Paul. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and for all your questions this afternoon. Uh, members, I'm moving on to the chair's business. Uh, I have no business uh, of my own. and One member has contacted me to raise an issue in uh, chair's business, and that is the only item I will allow. Uh, I've already spoken to the member. He knows what I'm hoping he will come forward with. Uh, Councillor Gallagher. Thank, thank you, Chair, for letting us in. And it's, 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 it's only come to uh, the fore uh, in recent days, but uh, there was an announcement around the Department for Communities uh, has issued a draft budget, and I'll keep it as brief as I can, but in that draft budget, it, it's seen a reduction of one and a half million pounds that will remove help and support uh, that is given to the most vulnerable in our society, i.e., uh, are young, uh, people are on, on benefits, are older people, and are disabled people. This will see a loss of 45 jobs across the north in the independent advice service. Uh, and when we look at the when we look at the most recent times and, and what has happened, particularly around this pandemic, we've seen upwards of 80,000 people 
coming on to universal credit. We have seen 6,000 pup appearance backlogged. And when you see this coming out on a, on, on, a, on a draft budget, this massive reduction, you say to yourself, is who's going to pick up all those cases? Where are they going to go? Who, who and most vulnerable people in our society is going to look and turn for some independent advice? And it's not going to be there. And this is going to have a, a drastic impact in our district. So, Chair, just to sum up and not hold it back too long, I have a proposal and I put it under the chat box. Uh, thank you, Councillor Gallagher. The proposal is in the chat box, will be typed up. Do I have a seconder for that proposal? I, uh, okay, Councillor Reddy is seconding that. Well, you've already spoken to to the uh, the, the motion and its nature. Uh, <coughs> uh, Councillor Duffy. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you to Councillor Gallagher for bringing up the issue. It is a really important issue, and it is one that the Minister has brought forward herself and launched the CIA in terms of her budget. Um, she does have her own concerns around the draft budget that has been allocated and what that will mean um, for herself and for her department. Um, she has highlighted that it is uh, as a result of the block grant um, where the British government have again failed to, failed to give any sort of uplift. uplift. Um, it, it is not her final budget allocation and she is currently lobbying for more money and do absolutely protect those folks in need, as Councillor Gallagher has outlined there. Um, if anything, as a council, we should be offering her our support in terms of um, lobbying for additional money. This is the problem that we have when we have yearly budgets. Um, they are consistently problematic. They demonstrate the structural inequalities um, that exist around the block grant and, and then the outworkings of that in terms of the departments and their ability to plan and their ability to budget. So this is something that needs to be absolutely resolved. Um, Deidre has herself given um, a commitment that she is going to continue to lobby for an uplift in her budget so that this doesn't have that devastating impact that, that Councillor Gallagher has outlined. So as a party, we have absolutely no issue in supporting the, the proposal as, a, as it stands. Uh, thank you, Councillor Duffy. Councillor Farrell? Yeah, uh, the SLP support the proposal as well. I would have been happy to second, but I'm not a member of this committee, so Councillor Riley did that. Um, the one and a half million uh, cut to the advice sector um, is going to impact uh, jobs in our council area. It's going to impact the ability of the advice providers that we have to provide free, independent and impartial advice. So we should be doing everything in our power uh, to highlight this and to appeal to the minister to, uh, to, to make the right decision here. But we have to remember that it's not just this one and a half million for the advice sector. Um, there were various um, new decade, new approach commitments that, that were supposed to be funded uh, in this term uh, that would have made a tangible difference to people's lives. You know, there was people with terminal illnesses. Currently, they're only allowed to apply if they have six months they live. The proposal was that they could apply with a year left. Uh, there was changes around the, the two-child uh, policy on tax credits or, or universal credit. And there was a 50-odd million pound proposal about welfare mitigations as well. So it's a lot bigger than the one and a half million. Our council should respond to the entire draft budget proposal. Um, the deadline's the 25th of February, so we need to get a move on. And I would probably need to go to health com and communities as well. I think that, that that's where it sits uh, best, but definitely 
we should be challenging uh, this draft budget because it's not going to work for anybody in our community. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Farrell. I understand your point with regard to health and community. But when I spoke to Councillor Geller, the urgency of the matter, uh, I, I was content that it would be brought to our attention at the, at the, at the earliest. Um, Councillor Riley, do you, you seconded? Do you wish to speak to the motion or are you content? I'm uh, content, Councillor Farrell, spoken for us, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see anybody. Um, Councillor, uh, sorry, Alderman Devenny. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and first of all, uh, I want to declare an interest because I sit on the advice panel. Um, but I do understand uh, and I welcome this uh, proposal coming forward here um, uh, at this meeting. And I know I'm not a member of the committee, Chair, but I do appreciate the urgency of, of this um, motion coming forward here because at the end of the day, um, our advice service out there are under severe pressure at the moment. And look, it has been exacerbated by the, the pandemic. Uh, and as that carries on for another year, and with, with um, employment issues and a lot of people seeking to get onto benefits uh, and seek advice and independent advice, I think this is very, very prudent. So our party has no problem, Chair, uh, in supporting this proposal. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Alderman Devaney. Um, no others, and I don't hear anybody uh, looking to go contrary to the proposal. I'll hold for a minute. I'm content that there that members of committee are are happy enough with the motion, and it's proposed by Councillor Gallagher, seconded by Councillor Riley, as printed, and declare that motion passed. Uh, moving on to the matters of raising. Right. Matters are raising pages 13 through to page 17. Is there chair, any member chair, which is With your permission, Chair, I'm conscious you're on Chair's business. Before you move on, I, I have just added a point to the chat box if you would allow me in briefly on a matter that has only arisen today, so I wasn't able to bring it to your attention. Very, very quickly. Yeah, Thank you. thanks, Chair, for your indulgence. It's just to record condolences on the passing of Captain Tom Moore, who passed away today, uh, is to alert members to that uh, death, but also to indicate that uh, Mayor Brian Tierney intends to open a book of condolence for people to to pass their on their condolences on his passing. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Councillor Riley, I would really appreciate uh, that you have brought that I personally wasn't aware of it. Very, very sad news indeed for for everyone. And uh, I'm sure all members of committee and council will indeed uh, be content that uh, their condolences are, are being passed on. Very sad news indeed. Um, one in a million or, or one in 30 million, one could say. Uh, that is very sad news and I'm so, really sorry to hear that. Um, Councillor Doyle is present. He has a pecuniary interest in the previous items to state out. Uh, Councillor Doyle uh, is at the meeting now. Uh, moving on, uh, where, where were we? Uh, matters are rising on pages 13 to 17. Any member with a matter arising? If not, we're moving on to item 9. Before we move on that, uh, Councillor Doyle, you wanted to come in on the matters you're raising on item 21, the Northwest Regional Development Group, page 17. No, oh, sorry, Chair, it was um, GSP 521. Um, that's the um, presentation on Freeport's innovation zones on page 14. Well, uh, my apologies for reading the wrong thing. Go ahead. All right, Chair. Um, I just note. Um, that's the only opportunity I'll get to raise it, that there's some concern uh, in and around the Strathoil area about some plans um, by the port to um, erect another shed um, and on an issue with regards to um, a coal uh, processing facility. Um, I know that there's some concern in the community about that. And I'm wondering if uh, 
perhaps maybe at the next meeting a, a paper could be brought um, with obviously your indulgence chair as I'm not a member um, to um, give us an overview of what the plans for those might be. Um, I think there's, there will be a, a fairly widespread concern about the proposals. Thank you. I would imagine I uh, refer to the chief executive that that would lie with an environmental health. Would that be correct, chief executive? Uh, Mayor, thank you for the comments, Councillor Doyle. Um, if if uh, if if it would be helpful, what I'll do is I'll look into the matter, and then with members' indulgence, um, bring it to the appropriate committee. Uh, content, Councillor Doyle. Yes, I see you. You are. Uh, and I'm presuming that there are a couple of members may wish to declare an interest in, in that short discussion there. Um, moving on to thank you. Item nine, the uh, report on the uh, UBI steering group. Not sure who's taking that. Good afternoon, Chair, Chair. and and. Members can see that it's for information, but the purpose of the report was just to provide members with an update in terms of the first steering group that be taking place. And you may recall that we have two elected members represented on the steering group, um, Councillor Farrell and Councillor first meeting. And since putting together that report, members, uh, we've been invited now to put in a quote um, on their draft press release. We have um, secured a quote from the mayor, which will hopefully go out in the next few days. So um, it's a work in progress. Um, it was very interesting to hear the presentation from Scotland, um, who, despite having worked for um, quite a considerable time, on this approach are finding that they've got lots of obstacles in terms of its implementation, particularly around um, delegated authority in order to take it through. So very interesting for us to learn from um, that it's an issue that's throughout the world and different countries and cities taking it forward. But within a local context, it's very useful to have um, Scotland Chair, happy to take any comment and questions members have in relation to it. Thank you. Thanks, and I've just just realised that we're, we're looking at uh, matters for information, uh, but thanks for for that. Uh, and could I ask that um, Alderman McCready and Councillor Ferguson have declared an interest in Foyle Port? Uh, I've started taking these, so item 10, uh, the recommendations are there for information, uh, including information from Nilga. Um, any, anybody requesting in on that? Quite a lot of information. Item 11, uh, Innovation Enterprise Zones. Again, that is for information. Um, Press Officer Re Media. Looking and don't see anybody wishing to come in on item 11. Uh, correspondence. Yeah, yeah, chair, oh, item, 11. Sure. item 11, innovation. Sorry. And the president. No, sorry, not item 11, item 12. Item 12, press media, or press yes. office media. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm conscious these are just matters of information, but again, it, I think it's appropriate that we uh, that we record the the value of the marketing team to the council corporately uh, in terms of raising awareness of the work the council does, but also uh, given the pandemic and the the nature of the work of that department in getting public health messaging out to our citizens and our ratepayers. And indeed, many of other council areas rate peers would have followed and taken advice from our uh, from our uh, platforms and channels. So it's to it's to just to record thanks to all the team in that section for the work that they do. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Riley. Uh, Alderman McClintock. Just thank you. Just to be associated with those remarks, I think our press and media department do a fantastic work, and they're obviously very busy, a very small workforce. But we are really appreciative of all the messages that they send out. So just want to be associated with Councillor Riley's comments. Thank you. And I note uh, Councillor Duffy is agreeing with those sentiments, as indeed I would as chair, and that will be passed on to to the team. 
uh, who do a fantastic job. Uh, moving on, I'd, uh, correspondence, any member of correspondence? None. Can I ask for a proposal to go into committee? Uh, so proposed, so Chair Councillor Riley. Proposed, Councillor Riley. Second. Seconder. Sorry, Sean. Councillor Mooney? Is that right? That's right. Thank you, Councillor Mooney. Members agreed. Thank you. Can we wait till I get word that we are off public?